Ruth, will you uh, see if the young man's ready in the television room, please? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry about that. I want to call to order the uh, Wednesday, May 11th, 2016, Town Council's Finance Committee meeting. Uh, we, it's a little bit after 3 o'clock. We are scheduled today to go from 3 until about 6 o'clock, uh, possibly a little earlier than that. Um, so I do want to call the meeting to order um, for the minutes and for the record just to note that all members of the Finance Committee are present as well as uh, many of our town staff including the town manager. Uh, today's um, agenda really cover, will uh, cover two aspects of this uh, budget cycle. The first is um, really to review the staffing proposals that were presented to the uh, Finance Committee in the budget uh, recommendations. Um, they were not included in the recommendations, but um, we do want to take those into consideration on behalf of the staff's um, um, uh, positions. And then also for the Finance Committee to discuss and approve its final recommendations that it will forward to the Town Council for the um, May 18th, uh, excuse me, um, yeah, May 18th, May 18th, uh, second reading. Um, with that, um, is there a motion to approve the minutes from April 20th? Second. And all in favor? Great. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to turn this now. Uh, the first part of this will be the staffing proposals. Um, we're kind of uh, allocated from 3 uh, three o'clock until 4 o'clock for the positions. And I'm going to turn that over to uh, our manager, Tom Hall, to begin the conversation. Great. Thank you. Yeah, we allotted an hour for this part of the conversation. Clearly, that's kind of a soft target. But uh, just to set that as the expectation, I think from our perspective, we can do what we would like to do in that time frame. The first position is the sustainability coordinator. This is a shared position, and I believe Dan Bacon's been kind of designated or through the short straw, I'm not sure how you'd like to put it, uh, to speak on behalf of his colleagues. And they're here as well. Bruce Gulliffer and, and uh, Mike Shaw will certainly be able to chime in if you need some more detail. Um, as uh, they come on up here, uh, tab nine of your budget book, exhibit two, has some of the initial information provided for each of these positions, and this one in particular is Exhibit 2A, 2B. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Dan Bacon, Town Planner, um, and Mike Shaw, Public Works Director. As the manager introduced, uh, this position is, is really proposed to be shared um, three ways or more, really. Um, it's, and we came up with the term sustainability coordinator for really a lack of a better term. Um, it's, that's a broad and kind of vague, vague term, and I think we want to kind of really draw attention to the kind of roles and functions of the position more than the name. We, could, we struggled with the name um, for a while. And really the, the, the thrust of the position is um, to establish one staff who focuses on energy initiatives. We have a very active energy committee. Um, Tom's very involved. I think uh, Councillor Chiesa was on, on the committee and, and Councillor Donovan has been in the past. And right now we really don't have the staff assistance to, to make substantial gains in terms of implementing the town's energy plan from 2011 and um, continuing and furthering a lot of the projects that we've progressed in the last few years. Um, in fact, I think that the seed for this idea came out of the energy plan that was produced in 2011. So this isn't a new idea, um, and that's a real thrust of this potential position is to, is to make um, more meaningful gains, gains in, the energy, in the energy world in Scarborough. Uh, we made some great gains, but there's a lot more that can be done. Uh, the second focus of this position would be around solid waste recycling composting. Um, the report that was produced just this past winter around reducing our solid waste uh, inputs to EcoMain also recommended uh, a staff person to kind of focus on those efforts to really to make more meaningful progress. And, and Mike is much more well versed in how that can help us fiscally, and I'll let him speak to. 
um, some potential there. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, the, 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 the report that Dan mentions actually uh, calls out a, a lot of good uh, good data that uh, that makes sense, and uh, probably the, the lowest hanging fruit and one of the things the report talks about, um, in years past, uh, we had a higher recycling rate. We were pulling more material out of the, the uh, municipal solid waste stream, um, and, and actually around that time was when we were uh, sharing a position with the, the city of Saco, and we had a recycling coordinator. And so just, uh, just the, in, in, in order of magnitude, uh, you know, our, our average recycling rate now is about 32%. Uh, we peaked in 2008 at around 36.1. And those additional 191 tons today, if we were to divert those back out of the waste stream, uh, would, uh, would, would save us uh, would diver in diverted costs of about $13,500. Um, so, you know, we're talking about a, a position with, a, with, with an implementation cost of 73, uh, 13 plus of that uh, could, could very easily, because uh, we've done it in the past, could very easily be uh, pulled out of that. And, and then on top of that, and, and you know, obviously uh, these, are, these are, uh, are, are extremely high numbers, but you know, in, in a solid waste study uh, in 2011, uh, it was identified that there, uh, in, in our waste stream in Scarborough, in a characterization study, there, is, there are an, an additional 1,000 tons of added uh, recycling that could be pulled out beyond that, as well as another 2,000 tons of organics. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking 200 plus thousand dollars worth of avoided tip, co uh, tipping fee costs. Uh, even even just a, a, a small one or two percent uh, uh, increase, uh, you know, pulling some of that out of there means real money as well. And so, uh, from that standpoint, it's a, it's it's a very uh, uh, worthwhile position. And uh, if, if you don't mind, Dan, I'll. Uh, I'll also mention another piece that uh, is, is, is near and dear to my heart, uh, the stormwater compliance piece. Yeah. And uh, you know, this, this position uh, would uh, help fill some of the, um, I'll call them gaps that we have in our program right now. And then uh, last week when I was up here before you talking, uh, I had hinted at a 2018 uh, new permit cycle that was coming around. Uh, Councilor Chiazzo is asking about water quality. Well, that's going to be our opportunity right there. The analytics piece is, is going to be coming in that next permit cycle. Uh, field work would be one of the things that uh, this position could, could easily cover and uh, could be done in-house and, and save us with uh, uh, to have, having to um, hire outside consultants and so forth and so on. So there's a lot of value there as well. Just to follow up a little bit on Mike's comment about the recycling percentage, I think back in the, those first few years that we started that program, that's when the town at the time actually had a half-time recycling coordinator. So I think that's indicative of if there's staff dedicated to the initiative and the outreach around it, that's actually when we make gains in that regard. And with a new composting program, if there's, again, staff <coughs> dedicated to it, I think the the rate of composting like recycling is likely going to rise and then help us fiscally on, on the other side at Eco Maine. Um, and that's in large part the region, reason that a focus would be on energy as well is not just because it's the right thing to do, it's uh, in terms of benefiting the town's bottom line and reducing our, our energy costs, looking at building efficiencies, looking at alternative energy sources that can uh, fiscally benefit the community as we move forward. Um, I guess the last piece of the position and that relates to community services is that this would assume um, taking over or, or including the beach monitor, monitoring duties that exist today. Right now community services spend $12,000 a year on those obligations and those responsibilities around the piping plover management and outreach, education, volunteer. Um, recruitment and, and oversight. So this position would would take over those responsibilities um, and fold in those kind of coastal resources, um, those coastal resources duties. And so we I think we acknowledge it's a kind of a wide range of things, um, but they're all important emerging issues that we either have to do or we think um, if we do can can help the community both environmentally but also. Uh, economically and fiscally, so that's that's really the background uh, behind uh, the proposal and and the wide range of things that.
potentially this person could, could work on and progress that right now we're doing here and there at the staff level, um, but no one's dedicated to, to doing it week in and week out and kind of really progressing these initiatives. We can do it as as we can between other responsibilities. Yeah, I think it's important to note that this person, it, it's a fairly tall order, and it's going to be interesting to find the person with the right skill set, frankly. Um, but it's important to note that this person won't be working totally independently. I mean, all of us at the table and many more staff members who have developed an interest and an expertise in one or more of these areas will continue to be involved. The real difference we find, uh, particularly supporting committee work, is if there's not work that gets done between committee meetings, or you know, often it's a last minute dash to put the agenda out and um, that's really where the value added will come, that you'll have someone that will have that extra time, that extra focus, maybe be sole focused on one of these initiatives if, the, if that demands their attention at the time. And I really think there's a value added component. And just to the quantification of, of kind of return to the investment on the investment, I would look to make a requirement for this position and the other we'll talk about in a moment uh, that they document and justify their so-called value uh, on a going forward basis. I would love to be able to present you know, those details with you, to you today. I think um, you know, Mike and Dan have done a pretty good job of telling you where we've been in the past, and that's a reasonable estimate of where we might get to again. But I think intuitively uh, there's a bottom line component to this position and somewhat the, the next as well. Excellent. Questions? <coughs> Yeah, I had a couple questions. Um, so, uh, so the first thing is on the recycling rate. We had a constituent, I think, a while ago, ask some questions about how we're calculating our recycling rate and things like that. I just want to make sure that we're looking at, because we had some discussions around the Energy Commission too about how we actually calculate that and what's a meaningful method to determine that. Because if we're using using the total volume of waste. If our volume of waste decreases, our recycling rate could increase or decrease depending on the volume or tonnage that we're putting through there. So when you're talking about those recycling rates, Mike, could you talk about is that based on total tonnage or is that based on a percentage of the volume of waste that we're putting through uh, uh, EcoMain? When I was running some of the calculations for the Energy Committee, uh, we, we, as an example, uh, our current recycling uh, I was looking at it from a, a town-wide, which is uh, the silver bullets, the curbside, everything like that, mm -hmm. and we were arriving at about 31.6, 32%. So then as a, as a, as a further exercise, uh, because we do have the capability to do it, uh, I, I looked at the um, curbside collection and the curbside tonnage and the curbside recycling rate and that sort of thing. Uh, interestingly enough, they just about mirror each other, and so um, you know the the percentage um, is is just that. I mean, the, the overall the overall MSW and the, and and everything that that we that it comes in has been between 5,000 and 5,400 ton for years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 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 been it, it's tremendously consistent. When the economy uh, when the economy took its downturn, you could you could see a change in in people's habits and, and what they were throwing away. But uh, you know, it's consistently in the the 51 to 53, 400 ton annual uh, going going to the going to Eco Main. So it's you, you can I, I guess if if I am understanding your question correctly, you you can look across a number of years and, and have a valid valid comparison uh, on tonnage uh, both by weight and 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 percentage. Okay. Um, and the other question I have is, um, it is a pretty tall order you're asking this individual to do, and it's a pretty wide-ranging skill set, it seems, between uh, beach observations and energy initiatives and stormwater compliance. I mean, that's a pretty broad bailiwick of stuff to have to handle. Do you foresee a certain prioritization of these tasks, or is it going to be kind of at an as-come-as-needed basis? Because I know there's, there's obviously needs right now because we don't have anybody on staff to do that. But uh, you know, it, it, I, I'd hate to put somebody in a fail position to fail where we've got five or six initiatives and everybody wants it done next year, uh, and we have one individual who's trying to coordinate all this stuff. So, do you there's foresee a, any kind of? There's a seasonality for sure. The beach okay. stuff, obviously, that's, that's clear. The other one will be really on demand, uh, depending on what committee needs are, uh, what other staff needs are. Um, so, w w this person's going to have to be flexible as well. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think it's important to note that we're not throwing them to the wolves and they're fully responsible for all this stuff. 
there's a bunch of resources that we've kind of built over time. Uh, none of us have uh, the, the full skill set. None of us have the full time attention to direct any one of these things. And that's really what, what we find where we're not quite going to that next level. And we're South Portland and both, as well as Falmouth, have positions like this, and their focuses in those communities are energy and the recycling, composting um, disciplines. Mm -hmm. And we'd expect those are the areas where we'd look for an individual with those skill sets. The others are really assisting mm -hmm. other experts in the community. You know, we have a great town engineer who understands the stormwater program and would give direction uh, when their time allows for this position to work on that. Mm -hmm. um, um, in terms of beach monitor duties, I mean, community services understands that program and can gr give direction to this staff person. So yeah, I think it's really more energy and solid waste that we're looking for more expertise and leadership, and the others is taking direction from, I from think the staff. job description and the, the position requirements would, would suggest that that would be the kind of thrust and emphasis. Um, the other duties are really more. You know, the beach coordinating, uh, it, it's recruiting and coordinating volunteers. It's kind of a management function. You don't need to be a wildlife biologist to do that to the, do that job. There's, there's additional things we'd love to get into, the water quality testing and, and beach profiling. There's all sorts of further things we could expand into, but that's probably more than we could expect right now anyway. Uh, and this is the last question, if I could. Um, we, I know we've touched on this a little bit before uh, in the past. Any opportunity for a shared service model with this position regionally, or uh, if we were to hire this person, might there be interest in other communities to possibly piggyback? I mean, we're obviously overloading this individual as it is now, but um, I'm just wondering if that was, I, I know we've talked about that in the past. Uh, I, I, I don't know what the availability is out there, but for uh, yeah, I in that regard, before we even put this to paper, uh, I did contact Jim Gailey in South Portland, knowing they have a full-time sustainability coordinator, again, focused predominantly, not exclusively, on energy and solid waste. Um, she has no additional time to give, so um, that's suggestive of where we might end find ourselves, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, I think there is a lot of interest among municipal municipalities in these areas. So I think it's going to become more and more prevalent. And I think uh, when more communities are interested and have this need, uh, there might be more opportunities for partnership. Okay. Okay. Just a quick question. I, you know, I, I guess from just from my personal view, um, as we consider these new positions, which are all additions to the budget that we have, um, my question is really going to be, you know, how do we finance that and where are we and what does it mean? So I, I heard you say there's some savings, um, but how certain of the savings are you? So in other words, if we move forward with this position, are we going to see some adjustments to the budget, some of the line items you just discussed? And two, as it, as it relates to the beach side, is there any beach revenue or additional beach revenue that we can bring on board that helps defer the cost? Not that it has to be answered today, but I'd be curious what the real net cost of this position is. I heard 13000 on 73. So I, if there's any way to quantify what the real trade-offs are and whether there's, there's savings to be found in the budget that helps sustain this position that you're willing to, to do the budget adjustments for. Yeah, I think in terms of <coughs> solid waste, there's maybe more kind of clear potential in terms of X percentage improvement in recycling and composting gets uh, cost savings to the community and we can we can forecast that. The energy piece is, um, I think that has even more potential, but that's harder to quantify where we are sitting today. I mean, there's, uh, I know in South Portland and in Falmouth, the, um, the folks that are in these positions are, one of the things they're working on is converting all their street lights to LED, which is, um, potentially a, you know, tens of thousands, if not $100,000 savings after it begins to pay itself back in, in five or six years. So there's initiatives like that that, that need someone like this to, to be working on it in a weekly, monthly basis. But it's, it's really hard to sit here and say, next fiscal year, that's going to be $100,000 back to the community. You know, it, they, those initiatives need to be progressed and mm -hmm. the payback is a bit further down the road. Um, this also does, the, so the net right now is 
12,000 um, because the 12,000 that community service pays the beach monitor would would be calculated in here um, just to, that, to say clarify that, say that. that. Say that again. The net increase in the town's budget, if it moved forward with this next year, would be 61, not 73. Mm -hmm. Just because of the $12,000 we're already committed to with the beach monitor position being assumed to, to yeah. perform these duties. Um, Thank you. And, and I guess I, I would be, uh, for the upcoming fiscal year, I'd be hesitant to, to, to pull that $13,000 out for this coming fiscal year only because you need the time to to get the programs up and running and that sort of thing. Okay. But I would certainly expect that you would see that, um, and I, I would hope a, a little bit more in the in the following fiscal year. Okay. So. No good. Uh, so two uh, two pieces. One is I did have a question regarding the presentation because it does provide both the gross and the net and the documentation. Mm -hmm. So 73 and then underneath it, um, from just from a, a reporting perspective, Tom, mm -hmm. is that 12,000 from community services already transferred into a different budget? No, it resides in the community it's services. It's going to stay in the community budget. services? I think what would, uh, this position would be answerable to the Dan and be technically reflected in the uh, planning department budget. I think that's the way we'd like to set it up. But yeah. each of the contributing departments would uh, have an expense to help cover a quarter, if you will, of the position expense. So, um, unrelated to this particular position um, and going forward for other budgets, this is probably one of the greater challenges that I hear from other counselors in particular, and that is how do we truly understand the total cost of any given service or any particular program that we have because there it's, it's bifurcated in so many different areas. So you might have a piece in public works, you might have a piece in planning, you might have a piece in community services and not truly understanding what a program costs. So if we can just, this is kind of a good example of, of that challenge for us that we have going forward. Um, it's not necessarily um, important for me today, but um, I think Peter brings up a, a good point, but it goes into, I think um, it goes to what um, Tom said, and that is that it's um, the $13,000 on the solid waste is really a cost avoidance that can't be measured until you've actually realized those gains in the recycling. And I'm pleased to hear that we will, with these two, uh, with this position in particular, that we'll be documenting what those cost savings potentials will be, and then even projecting them out over a five or ten year period if they are continued. So I'm, I'm personally um, happy with that going forward as far as um, if it's approved, but. Yeah, just to follow up too on the, the stormwater compliance, we know we're going to have to be dealing with permitting issues in the future. We know there's going to be costs associated with that. We don't know what those are. So I'm assuming this person would be able to kind of put together an infrastructure or a groundwork or something in place ahead of time so that we're able to efficiently meet those requirements as they become aware so we're not reacting to mm -hmm. uh, increased uh, unfunded mandates, for lack of a better word, from DEP compliance or things like that. This person will be able to see that stuff coming and plan for that a little bit ahead of time. Is that fair? Or? Be, 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 uh, yeah, the, it, we still have to deal with the unfunded mandate, but, but, but have the time and, and the lead time, as you say, to, to, uh, to deal with it in a, as most efficient and cost-effective manner as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we would not be caught, we'd have less chance of being caught flat-footed and, uh, and having to react as opposed to be a little bit proactive. Uh, the last piece that I wanted to mention was really I just wanted to share with the public is that we did receive correspondence from both the uh, Conservation Commission and then also the Energy Committee in which they have uh, given their full support and recommendation to support uh, the sustainability coordinator position. So I do want to acknowledge that we did receive that and we'll also make sure the full council knows that they have uh, opined in on that as well. Any other questions on this position? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, the next one is really your department. Yeah, moving quickly to the second one. Again, as Dan mentioned, don't look up the titles. I think it's, a bit, it's very misleading, perhaps, in what the actual position responsibilities are. Yep. Uh, but I think it does, for me, evoke a, uh, with the title, a position that is, can work independently, is kind of senior level in terms of their capabilities. But if I had to attribute kind of uh, a percentage of time uh, to the different three basic functions, um, and those three functions are kind of budget analysts and comparative analysis, those sorts of much of the conversation that's taken place uh, in this committee, uh, purchasing and procurement, uh, and then finally general administrative kind of special project things. I would, I would uh, say it's probably a 40% for both 
budget analyst and purchasing and 20% for kind of other stuff. Uh, so uh, keep in mind it's really predominantly a finance focused position. Um, and to the to kind of the bottom line argument, um, again I can't quantify it, but we've had experience in the past with a full time uh, purchasing agent um, and Ruth had unearthed some materials. It's been a number of years since we've had that position full time. Uh, but they, there was an attempt at the time to document the kind of value uh, of that position. Again, I think intuitively, uh, if we buy smarter and cheaper, uh, it's going to save us, particularly in some of the big commodities. Um, and ideally, we'd love to make some inroads with the school department and really kind of exponentially increase our buying power and <coughs> scale. Um, and I, I guess over the course of the last year or so, and this committee that's seated here before me, uh, I think you've been very consistent about this whole comparative piece, um, whether it's establishing metrics for town and school, uh, benchmarking. Um, Ruth and I find ourselves in full agreement that we're never able to kind of get to where we need to go. And so we need someone with the skill set and the time and the attention to start to really make some headway on these things. And I think, frankly, once we put <coughs> the systems in place, it's going to be a lot easier to, to maintain them over time. But um, Hurting the cats, I say, uh, you know, of my municipal colleagues, getting other ones to, to partner with us so they can share their data with us, uh, it takes a lot of time and effort. Um, everyone nods their heads, but when it comes down to it, to get good comparative data that you can rely on um, has been a challenge for us. Um, so that's really the backdrop to why this position is for, before you and, and, and the timing of it, if you will. Um, I, I really think we're at a juncture where we need to take that next step. And I think we've made some pretty pretty big steps in terms of the budget process and the budget document, uh, but where I think we're lacking to take that next, uh, perhaps more important step <coughs> is the longer range forecasting uh, and budget analysis. So that's uh, essentially an overview of the, of the position. And just for the record, this uh, position currently is estimated at $84,508 all in mm -hmm. benefits and everything. So, uh, questions? Chris? So, Tom, could you address the, the question, uh, or the, I guess maybe concern, I guess for lack of a better word, in the past when the word budget analyst has been brought up, there's been some <coughs> consternation, I guess, uh, that this person is going to be ferreting through school and town budgets and looking at efficiency efficiencies on both sides. Um, I, if I read the description, Clear, uh, it doesn't really mention anything about interacting with the schools other than probably in the surface levels that we're doing right now. Can you just read? Well, I'm, I'm careful to respect territory okay. and what the charter says, I know clearly, uh, but I expect uh, largely in part uh, due to the kind of the cooperation and the sort of relationships we've built with the school department over the last several years. Um, if they see a good value in someone that can help them, um, I have no doubt that they'll be very willing to be a participant. This is not something I can or want to force upon them. Uh, but I think just on the town side, there's great opportunity. Sure. And then it's just value added to the other Okay. Thank you. Peter? No, nothing? Um, I'm going to save, I guess, uh, comments about what I support and don't support until after, yeah. right, if you don't mind. Um, sure. So after that, um, but thank you on, on that position. Um, the next is um, uh, police positions. I believe there were two positions that were requested for patrolmen. Yes. Well, the chief Patrol persons. Up, just a final comment on these two administrative positions. Yes. Um, should you, you be looking for a recommendation, I'll be suggesting that we delay the start till October 1st for a number of reasons, really based on practicality, not for budget savings, so then it's a, kind of a side right. benefit. As was mentioned, both these positions are going to be hard to fill. It's going to be the right person for the right job, and that might take some extra time in recruitment. Um, and then that's really the reason why I, and I don't think we're losing any ground. We've got money in the budget to deal with the immediate issues of beach monitoring mm -hmm. um, and, and those sorts of things. So I, I, I would be comfortable in saying that we should do without these positions for a bit, just because we're simply not going to hire them July 1st. Sure. So having said that, um, yeah, I know we're looking at annual costs, and that's important moving forward. Would you be giving a modified uh, adjustment to this budget? I'm prepared for okay. if, if you wish to have a recommendation, I'm prepared okay. for that. Okay. Thank you. Um, just so that it covers the next two, is that the same uh, premise? Should we approve the two police and the two fire positions so that there would be in October or mid-year, some mid-year, whether it's October or January, whatever it might be? Is that also? I don't have those prepared, but we can 
I think we can probably produce those pretty quickly if, if that's your desire. Okay. Yes. I'll come. Uh, I'll explain why I asked that question later. Sure. But yeah, go ahead. Uh, all right. Um, Chief, Chief Moulton, deputies, chiefs, chiefs, <laughs> chiefs, chief, chiefs. There's only one chief. There is only one chief. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's several. No, no, no. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, I, I just need you to know up front that I, I really need your help. Um, I, we have asked for positions along the way, and I have advocated for those positions, but I don't think I've ever been in front of you to say as emphatically as I am today um, what kind of a need we have. We're, we're, we're stretched in. This is, not a, this is not by any stretch a luxury request. This is, this is a real need. Um, with the territory that we have, 54 square miles, we've talked about this an, a number of times, I really feel that our minimum staffing um, should be at least three officers and a supervisor at any given time. Um, and although on paper we can do that, when you talk about full staffing, um, sometimes it's easy on paper, but then when you add in sick time, vacations, bereavement, paternity, injuries, training, vacant positions, there are very, very few for you few times that we are truly at full staffing. So um, there are many times that we're now running with either uh, two officers and a supervisor or to get that third person, we're spending overtime to do that. Um, many of our calls now are two unit calls. So a crime in progress, serious accident, domestic situation, any number of other calls that happens, um, we now have both officers, if we're running two officers and a supervisor, we now have both officers tied up on a call. Um, and any additional call type that comes in, um, you know, we've got a supervisor to respond to that, and, and that's it. We're done. And you could make that argument if we had 10 people. You could say that if enough calls happened, they'd all be tied up and so forth. But the fact of the matter is, is that's happening more and more often now. Um, we're just, uh, the, 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 the whole shift is, uh, is tied up oftentimes now, and it's... Um, we talked the other night uh, at the meeting at the high school about the population and how it's leveled off to a certain degree, and I agree with that. Um, you know, we're not growing at the rate that we were at one time, but there's still a fair number of neighborhoods and homes being built, and there's certainly incremental growth in the in the population, and and um, and that has been for some time. And I can appreciate recent budgets. We've been through tough times. We've not had the ability to increase staffing, but we've absorbed that incremental growth along the way by just stretching ourselves thinner and thinner. And in my opinion, we've reached that point where we just can't spread ourselves any thinner. I'd also point out that while there has not been a huge increase in population, there certainly has been steady growth commercially. And the numbers uh, that we show from SEDCO indicate 200 new businesses since uh, 2006. If you drive down through uh, Payne Road Corridor and Gallery Boulevard, that's not too hard to imagine. Um, I think that's a great thing. It's a wonderful thing for the community. And, and I certainly don't say this as any indictment of the businesses, but when you bring that volume of people in and that volume of traffic, you, there are just things that uh, inherently happen. We have traffic, increased traffic flow. We obviously have accidents. We have thefts from cars and businesses, rescue calls, bad checks, uh, and a number of other situations that require our attention. So for the year 2015, we looked at four of our uh, biggest businesses in terms of the call volumes. And those four businesses alone in 2015 accounted for 906 calls. Um, these calls showed an average on-scene time of 60 minutes. If you add in the response time and you add in the time that the officers are doing reports and so forth after that and follow-up and cataloging evidence and so forth, it e easily averages two hours apiece. So if you run those numbers, you're talking about 1,812 hours of, of time. For, those, for just four businesses. <coughs> if you look at a brand new person working 40 hours a week at 52 uh, weeks, you're looking at 2,080 hours. Then when you uh, factor in vacation, their allotted holiday and personal time, a couple of sick days, you're well under 1,900 hours of, of actual availability. And then you look at mandated yearly training and so forth, you're down to a point where, where those four businesses have accounted for the time, or the time equivalent, of a full-time officer on an annual basis. Um, it's, uh, 
it, it's getting tough. It's getting tough to keep our head above water. Aside from the, the, the issue of simply maintaining adequate number of offices to handle those call volumes um, that we're taking in, we're also suffering the reduced ability to engage in proactive enforcement and community service. I don't think that as day goes by that I don't hear from residents about traffic issues, our ability to respond effectively to complaints about people running red lights, speeding, texting while driving, is all diminished as a result of, of this lack of resources. Another piece that um, I feel we are not being as effective as we should be is with our younger students. This Operation Hope has been an eye-opener for us. As we interview more and more people that come through our door uh, who are suffering from su substance use disorder, and we hear their stories of hard drug use beginning at 11, 12, 13 years old. It's scary. And we're not talking about someone smoking marijuana or stealing a little liquor from the parents' uh, liquor cabinet. We're talking about drugs that can kill and can kill in one use. Um, we're talking about prescription opiates, heroin, cocaine. Uh, the sad thing is, I, I've mentioned to you before, I sit as chair of the executive board for New England Hyder, and I can tell you I see these threat assessments coming across, and th this is not getting better. It's not going to get better. It's, it's going to be worse before it does get any better. And, it, and it's scary to say that, but um, it's true. And I'm really concerned that we're not uh, reaching these kids early enough. I think it's imperative that we're able to make those connections with these kids all the way from K2 through the rest of their school years. And I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not uh, I'm trying to identify a, a, a school resource position at this point. I'm just saying, I think, you know, years ago we used to go to the schools, we'd send the uniformed officers to the schools, we'd do Halloween safety, bike safety, winter safety, a number of other age appropriate programs in the, in the K2 schools and right up through. And the importance of this is not just the material that's presented in the class, but it's the relationships that are built and the students' ability to see these officers in a positive light and feel that there's somebody that they can turn to when they're, when they're having a problem or, or, you know, somebody that they can confide in. Um, I'd like to speak briefly about the funding piece. You, you asked about the funding piece on some of the other positions. I would tell you that um, our evidence technician it was fully budgeted in FY17 at $98,555. Now that's salary and benefits, that's the whole, the whole thing. Um, he has given us formal notice that he's going to be in fact retiring as of July of, of this year. Um, using the worst case scenario of hiring, hiring somebody with experience who could be started at the step three level, that's according to the, to the contract, we can do that for people with experience. Um, and if they had the family plan uh, for health insurance, the new employee would cost $75,000, $74,500. Um, this would be a savings of $24,000 in worst case scenario. If we were to hire someone at step one with a single insurance plan, uh, that would cost $57,129, which would provide savings of a little over $40,000, $41,426 from what we budgeted this year. I can tell you right now um, that the candidates that are in final stages um, and would likely be hired for that position are in those step one uh, single categories. So it's very likely that we would uh, save more money than less. Um, when the budget was built, we also had two vacant dispatch positions. Those positions were built in, again, with the worst case scenario um, of hiring experienced dispatchers at step three with family insurance plans. The cost of salary and benefits for those two positions that have been filled, uh, I'm sorry, the cost and salary benefits for those two positions was 136128 That's what we built into the budget. In the interim, those positions have been filled, and with the actual cost for the two new dispatches who were hired at step one with single insurance coverage, the costs are 105456 or a savings of $30,672. Lastly, when the budget was built, we had a custodian um, that has since retired and has been replaced, and there's a salary benefit difference in that position of $8,087. So the total um, expense savings that we are absolutely assured of is $62,770, with the potential to be as much as $80,185, and again, with what we're looking at for finalists in those positions, that would um, appear to be the direction that it uh, probably would go. And I would also mention that we realized a, a very conservative estimate of an additional $30,000 in increased height of revenues uh, this year. And so my point is, is that with those savings and, and the um, 
savings and expenses and also these additional revenues, uh, we, we could be looking at 110185 um, And as outlined above, if, we'd step, if we hired those two new officers and we were lucky enough to hire them uh, with a single insurance rate and, and at step one, we would be looking at 114000 uh, 258, so about a $4,000 uh, difference. Uh, certainly, if we were given the opportunity, I could find uh, ways to make that happen within uh, this existing budget. If those positions were something that were hired at something uh, above step one, um, then I would, uh, my recommendation would be, or I would advocate for a delayed start. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I just want to be clear, I understand, Chief. Um, yep. We're looking on Exhibit 2D <coughs> here, and we've got the total new positions in the original budget. Uh, let me give you something to catch up. Uh, at the bottom of page, whatever, what page is that? Not numbered. Yep, you're, you're on the right page. You're on the right page, yeah. Yep. So at the very bottom of that page, it says 149.88. Right. And so what if, if I'm hearing you correctly, that range is actually going to be 110 to 114 and not the 149, or what is it? If, if, uh, if both, this is worst case, so if both of those new officers were hired at a step three level yep. with a family insurance plan, that's what it would be, 149.088. Okay. If we were uh, to hire somebody at step one, um, and they did, and they had a single health insurance. Then we're at one hundred and ten thousand dollars, or I'm sorry, one hundred and fourteen thousand dollars. And these numbers do not take into account the the money saved for dispatching custodian, or they do take that into account. The one hundred and ten thousand that I that I said would um, realize those savings from the dispatchers, the um, change of the evidence technician, okay. the custodian, and also the increased revenues from um, the height of okay. So, I, so just to clarify, what you're suggesting is that the cost reductions in your budget that you already know will yep. support the hiring of two positions. Correct. If, it, if, it's, if it is not step used one. for other positions. Correct. Okay. That's how I understand. Well, it. yep. two positions at step one. Yeah. Yes. If, if yes. It's step. And if they were beyond that, my recommendation would be that they'd be a delayed start. Right. Yep. Yes. Okay. That's great. Okay. Any other Anything you have? No, that's great. Okay. Um, j just a quick question. When you, <coughs> I mean, I'm, that's staggering to me. Nine hundred and six calls for four businesses. Yeah. yeah. Um, do any communities? I mean, this is a little bit off tangent. Yep. But do any businesses? I mean, we have impact fees for schools and other things. Do we have we ever thought of impact fees at all for police protection? Because I, I mean, I've heard Walmart in particular. I mean, because of drugs yeah. and other things. There's, I mean, that that's one thing. But the second thing that caught me, because I know when you say you have two officers at some of these incidents now, and you look around the country and you see what's happening. But have you had cases that you can share when that's really put other community members at risk because we just don't have resources? I mean, have there been any close calls? Have there been any anything that really suggests that this is this is something that's really critical for our community right now? Um, I'm not sure that I could give you specific examples. I could tell you that we certainly have to stack calls that we shouldn't be stacking. People uh, are waiting for. People are waiting for us, and they, pretty high and risk they situation. shouldn't need to be waiting for us. And some of those are, um, you know, like domestic violence. Those some of those can be serious situations yeah. that they're waiting for. And, and the other thing is, is that, you know, again, I, I can't em emphasize enough with the size of this community that if. You know, one of these domestic calls that requires two officers is uh, the other in the Broad Turn Road mm -hmm. or down in, on East Grand. There's no easy way to get to Higgins Beach or, or you know, Oak Hill or, or anything else. It's a it's a haul, yeah. and uh, you know, in those situations where people need help or an officer needs help and needs a backup, that's a that's a stretch. Yeah, so if I could, Chief, uh, yeah, I, I also found that number pretty staggering on four businesses. Um, is there any kind of security survey or request we could make for them to hire their own security that could help alleviate some of these calls, or is, are, are our hands pretty much tied and we have to just respond to what we get called for? 
Um, well, we have pretty much responded to what we get called for. These places do have their own security, mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately they can't make the arrest or, or issue the citation. So they, uh, uh, you know, they will hold these people, but then it's up to us to, um, you know, come in and either do the summons or make the arrest and so forth. And then, um, you know, I mentioned the kind of doubling of time because now, once that's been done, we've got to go back after they've had a chance to do their reports. We've got to go back and revisit them, Amen, get sir. their reports, get their video, uh, and so forth. It's a, it's a time, time-consuming thing. And um, to answer uh, Council Hayes' question about impact fees, um, I, I don't know. I mean, we certainly have floated that around, you know, at a staff level. Um, we've never had that conversation with the manager, and I. And I suspect, um, you know, just off the top of my head, I would think some of those places would say, well, we pay pretty substantial taxes too. Okay. So, yeah. uh, well, I, I mean, I guess I'm to me the sure. question is, I, I wonder what other communities we can't be we can't be unique in that. It, if that particular location is unique, that it strikes me that their business model is flawed some way. Um, so there must be other kind of theft prevention mechanisms that they can incorporate or. Um, you know, it, it, it's a pretty staggering number, so I would assume, yeah. it's a bad word, I know, but I would assume that it's in their best interest to rectify this situation as well. So is there any kind of interaction, outreach back and forth, or is it just kind of, you know, we're just, well, we're, we're, we're where we are, right? I mean, it, yeah, we're kind of where we are. I, I think that there have been uh, places where uh, Departments may take the attitude that there's a certain dollar amount and we're not going to respond or, um, you know, we will come once a week and pick up your, we have not taken that step. Um, it would be a tough one to take. And the irony, the, the private security that these companies do for themselves, frankly, the better they are, the more calls it generates for us. Right. Mm -hmm. they're, they're Making that initial shoplifting, we'll say, is probably the most prevalent mm -hmm. um, crime committed. Mm -hmm. uh, the more aggressive they are, the more work it is for us. Is there any, as uh, a sidebar, those four, is there any commonality among the four? I mean, are they retailers? Are there, are there certain retail, industries, yeah. certain retail. industries retail. where yeah. there is much more demand for services than other businesses? Yeah. I think so it's, it's like the box stores that are yeah. Yeah. the problem. And, and each of those businesses has asset pr protection yeah. people, like the chief was describing, mm -hmm. who witness the violations, but it's the police department's job to get them from yeah. the point of the violation right. being witnessed into right. the courtroom. Right. And that's what takes our time, transporting them to jail, issuing summonses, doing the discovery. I think it's pretty easy to discern where they are based on the yeah. call sheet and the leader. Yeah. <laughs> the police report and the leader. It's pretty clear without mentioning anybody. That's, that's a pretty good indication. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't read in that level of detail. <laughs> <laughs> that's oh, the first place I go. <laughs> I mean, as a parking lot, I mean, that may be a good thing to revisit. Whether there's some way, yeah, I, yeah. To, to address that issue and solutions, as you suggest. But yeah. that's a, that's an officer. I mean, that's that's a third of your personnel that is tied up. Mm -hmm. Yeah I, yeah, I mean, maybe they're, I, again, I'm just off the top of my head, it just seems like everything seems very passive in terms of hidden cameras, hidden people, you know, uh, maybe a more overt presence with a uniformed security guard walking up and down the aisles. I don't know. I, there's got to be some... some Unfo it's unfortunately, though, we're not in a position to mandate how, yeah, I know. You know, how those I, I, right. folks operate. And, and the other thing is, is that we're... You know, we feel an obligation to, to go, mm -hmm. um, and there are many of these situations, I mean, I talk about two-unit calls and so forth, but there are many of these situations that turn into two-unit mm -hmm. calls because they've got uh, either store security folks or even civilians sometimes chasing people that have yeah. run out of the store with <laughs> merchandise and so forth, and now you've got this thing where people are going in all directions and we're getting calls and the officers are headed up there and it's... Yeah, I'm not sure if it's feasible, but I've suggested to the chief that maybe it's it's worth, particularly if we have a kind of con concentration of these calls in one area, you know, with, with a number of them close by, that, that we establish our own presence there, whether mm -hmm. it's substation or, uh, you know, again, it comes to resources, whether we can commit resources. Um, but I, I think we need to get creative. The, the problem's not going away, and there's no question there's a link between some of these drug issues that we're seeing yeah. in society yeah. and yeah. particularly these types of crimes. Getting the cash. 
I was just thinking maybe we could use the bus shelter that South Portland's going to pay for. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. More comfort. <laughs> I say it's like a page out of the Portland airport always has the police cruisers just parked. But every time you see it or I see it, I do the double take and you slow down. And There's nobody there. Do we have any old cruisers you can just plant someplace? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's other things. Just uh, any place where you attract people. I mean, there's hundreds, mm -hmm. if not thousands, of people that come and go from that parking lot. Just fender benders that are. Yeah, you know, that's true. These aren't crimes, but they take. Yeah. I, 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 and I'd be curious to, I mean, I don't think it's just a police issue, it's a community issue. I'd be concerned to, or, or curious if we could take that up in another venue uh, in addition to this to, to try and help work out those issues from a community standpoint of what can we do to help uh, short of, you know, restricting enforcement or something like that. You know, we, we've, we're all in the same community. We, maybe we can discuss other options out there. I don't mm -hmm. know. But it just seems very excessive to have four businesses mm. chewing up that amount of our resources. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure they do pay their taxes like everybody else, but that's a very disproportionate use of resources in my mind. Thank you for sharing that. It was powerful. And, and those are the four big ones. I'll, I'll tell you that there's lots of others that, you know, the numbers aren't quite as staggering, but they're still pretty... Uh, great. Keep us busy. Any other questions? Comments? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Thank all of you. Thank you. We got five minutes left for Mike. That's it. <laughs> Done. He's good. We'll, we'll give him ten. We'll give him ten since we started late. <laughs> Chief and Deputy Chiefs. Next is uh, the two fire department positions that uh, were requested. It was uh, at your place this evening, uh, and actually I sent the notices on Friday as well in advance. But there was uh, a bit of a further takeoff, if you will. Uh, is built upon materials in the budget document. And I think that's what Chief Little is going to speak off of today. Great. Go ahead, Chief. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity to advocate for these full-time positions uh, that were previously excluded from the budget. I did prepare a two-page handout for you um, that summarizes graphically and illustrates my rationale for trying to continue to make progress on our staffing plan, as well as identifying the cost implications in the proposed budget if we were to move forward. Um, at our first Finance Committee meeting, there was some questions about um, officers that came up. So the first page uh, is kind of a three-colored org chart. I, I want to take just a second and, and answer that question that was raised at the first meeting. And I think the question was around how many officers do you have? And, our department is a little complicated. We're a three-legged stool with a call company, a per diem force, and a full-time force. And what I've done here is try to color code the officers and the different uh, employment groups to help illustrate how that works. So on the left, there in blue, uh, we have two district chiefs who oversee uh, three call companies each. We have six call companies in the six neighborhoods where our fire stations are. We have six captains. Each firehouse has a captain that oversees that station. And we have a total of 10 lieutenants. And typically in a uh, fire organization, you have a, a captain for the house, and then each apparatus in that house has at least one lieutenant uh, that oversees the crew. And uh, it, they're really, all of the call force offices are intended for what we call line function. It's for when you're at an emergency scene, you have an officer and a crew of two is the typical arrangement that is giving a duty, whether it be to drag a hose line or to raise a ladder or to perform some kind of a function. So all the folks in blue are our call officers. They don't, they are only paid when they respond to calls or go to training. Uh, and they're the folks that keep the call company uh, organized and active and have their monthly business meetings and respond when they're able to. In the middle, the yellow section illustrates our current full-time staffing and the officer uh, and uh, employment group that follows. So we've got two full-time deputies, Deputy Deering and, and Atato. They oversee, uh, Glenn oversees operations and maintenance, and Glenn oversees, our, and uh, Tony oversees our emergency medical services. Then we have one duty officer who currently is classified as a paramedic lieutenant. And then below that paramedic lieutenant, we have our full-time staff, which is four people, uh, and this is our peak, daytime staffing. So we have four people on duty on the ambulances, two on each truck, and we run two. 
We have one on our busiest engine, engine seven, and then we have one what we call a pool position, which is a position that was instituted about four years ago now, which was designed to save overtime costs. So that person is assigned to engine seven as their normal place when they come to work in the morning, but the first person that we have out on sick or vacation or injury, that person is used to fill that and avoid overtime. And then we have 11 per diem firefighter EMTs spread throughout town, so our peak daytime staffing is 17. The proposal in the budget uh, when we negotiated our last contract, we saw that our span of control was too high. And one of the things that we talked about was when we got to a certain number of staffing, we should institute an additional level of full-time oversight. So the positions in green illustrates what this next proposal would look like. The chiefs stay the same. The change is that the duty officer, who is currently a paramedic lieutenant, becomes a captain. And then we create a new lieutenant's position um, where the folks on Engine 7 now who are privates become lieutenants. And then we split the responsibility. So instead of a 17 to 1 uh, span of control, we cut that in half to a more manageable 8.5 to 1 ratio. And that was all negotiated on the contract, and it is triggered at the point when we hire the next two full-time personnel. That gets us to that trigger point that we had identified several years ago in the staffing plan. Does that answer the questions from, from the first? Yes, thank you, Chief. Excellent. Um, Chief, the only – so I just want to make sure. Uh, the, green is, um, the green is what is the new structure. It's not necessarily a totally different. It's a new structure, right? It, it, we're adding, we're converting. It's the yellow reconstructed based on the new position. The yellow okay. reconstructed, we're converting a private to a lieutenant. Yep. So um, you said on the, um, you did the ratio, instead of 17 peak time, it's now 8. Um, can you explain that part again? Because that's where I, because I'm looking and it still looks like 6, 17. Um, so there are still 17 people working at peak time on that oh, shift, the additional but now we've got two split. people okay. supervising them instead of one. Okay. Just a good question. The, the last part of your statement, the, the green, which is what you're proposing to move to, are, are you, did I hear you say that, that is contractual, you're contractually obligated to be here because of, or is this just your proposed model? No. When we, when we negotiated our last contract, yeah. we identified the need for this additional change in rank structure. So we created the officer pay scales. Yeah. And we put those in the contract, but they don't take effect until we hit that certain number of full-time personnel. But, but just make sure I understand. So, but, but I've been a little slow, so I've got to got to walk me. So, but my specific question: contractually, if you hire more people, then it triggers what you have here in green. That is correct. Is, is that what you're saying? That is that this is this is sort of locked and loaded, contractually yes, obligated. It is. Yes. So the hiring, so the, did the two we hired last year trigger this, or the two we're proposed to hire is going to trigger? In yeah. the in the staffing plan, when we last year's request was actually for four, four yeah, five yeah. people, that was the trigger. Those four, because we only hired two, we did not implement it. Right. But when we hire the next two, that completes, that creates the trigger yeah. where we need to invest in the officer positions. And if we don't hire the second two, it's postponed till the next time we do. So, I mean, that's, so that, that's kind of the rubric that we're at, right? Yes. And then that's why there's two costs in, yeah. your, in your budget. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. So I wanted to be transparent, make sure no, you no, knew what you. those no, costs no, were. A little complicated. Thank you. Yep. So, no. so before we get into the substance, um, the model itself, is this a standardized model that other communities are using that are comparable in size? Is this a unique model? No. Is, it a pre you know, is it a preferential model that you, your team has decided to make? Can you kind of explain the background on how you created the model? Sure. It really is an industry standard. The, the typical fire organization, as I started to explain, was you know, the call company and a lieutenant on each piece. That's typical in the fire service, and that's what we need to have a coordinated effort for the teams in the field. Um, and our organization on the staff side and the full-time side is exactly what, what everybody else is doing. We've been doing okay. it with less supervision than most for some time because of our unique three-legged stool approach to staffing. So if I could, Chief, um, on, your, on your call member staffing, mm -hmm. um, 
can you walk me through how that works? Is everybody kind of, I mean, the, the pagers go off and everybody is around that responds, or is it, is it certain people on certain days are on call? And I mean, how do you regulate that 97 call members? Sure. The 97 call members each belong to a company, so they yeah. belong to the company where they live in their neighborhood. Uh, and most of the time, they, they only respond when their calls, when their, their piece or their station is summons to the call. So when we have a call in town, not necessarily every truck goes. It depends on the severity of the call and where it is located. Um, that being said, now that our numbers are getting down fairly low, if we've got active call members on you know, the Pleasant Hill side of town and there's a, an incident on the Dunstan side of town, we do have folks that, you know, we're all one department. They, sure. It's not that they can't come, but their primary responsibility is for their trucks in their neighborhood to make sure that we're adequately staffed when they need to go. And do they rotate on call days, or they, they don't? The call members themselves are, are, you know, come when you can. Okay. Uh, we don't schedule those. That's what the per diem program is. The the scheduled shifts, uh, and we have a number of the call members. Forty people out of that ninety-seven actually participate in the per diem. I don't count the numbers twice, but they do also work as per diem on scheduled shifts okay. as well as belong because they happen to live in town and and serve both ways. So what's the order then? Again, I apologize. I'm sure this is basic stuff for you. When when the order when a call comes in, you've got your per diem people who are in the house respond. If you've got two people on an apparatus, a lieutenant and a and a and a private, let's say, mm -hmm. you then would have a call member come in to fulfill that team. Are you whoever comes, shows up from the call would come in and augment that team or, or complete that team? Right. That's correct. Okay. Most most of the call members during the day, the the on duty staff takes the trucks and goes, the call members meet us at the scene. Yep. Most of our staffing is only during the day, so we've got very little staffing at <coughs> night, so the call members come to an empty station and take the truck, or some of our live-in students who are there yep. take the truck. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You're yeah, very welcome. So on the second page, uh, that's where I've kind of summarized some of the data that I submitted with my original proposal for the, to justify the staffing. Um, the story is really all about the double whammy of the increased calls for services, and you've got a chart there um, out of the staffing plan that shows the historical growth that is really on a, uh, a pretty steady incremental increase. Over the past five years, that average increase has been about 3.65 calls per year. Um, so in 2015, we responded to just short of 4,200 calls, and by 2020, we expect that to be over 5,000 calls, or about 12 calls per day. This isn't a new problem. Uh, you know, our calls are, are going up just like they are nationwide. And the second graphic shows the number of call members. We were 318 in 1980. We're down to 97 in 2015. Uh, it's a national prob problem. It's been decades in the making. And I think we've been, uh, as a department, very proactive in identifying it early. We, 30 years ago, started our day firefighter per diem program to help bolster the call force, and it has saved this community millions of dollars in, in cost. Um, and we've incrementally made changes and added to that, and now we have um, a good complement of folks during the day, and we're starting to build some of that nighttime coverage that is essential because there are times when the trucks just don't go at night, and we don't want to have a situation like we had um, in Pleasant Hill where we, we saved a young man and gave an award uh, at our last a woods banquet who uh, suffered a cardiac arrest almost next door to the station. You know, we, we've got to be able to get those AEDs out there rapidly in those neighborhood fire stations. So uh, between the increased calls for service and, and the decrease in call members, we, we really are up against it. Um, in FY16, as you remember, we requested four full-time members. Only two were approved, and we delayed that implementation until April of this past year, so they just started. Um, and because we knew that we were going to have to bear the cost of the full year of those two people, instead of coming in with the, what the plan called for and asking for another four, we cut that back to just the two to get us caught up to what the original request was for last year. And, and I'd like to speak for just a second about how important it is that we complete that second phase of that process, because it takes four full-time bodies to run a 24-hour shift seven days a week. And the EMS services and all of our peer departments, we all run a 24-hour schedule. So our guys work 24 hours, they're off for 48, they work for 24, then they're off for 96. 
that's the preferred schedule, that's what all our competition is. Well, unfortunately, when we hire in increments of two, we need to put those two in the off mm -hmm. years on a different schedule. And they work a four 12-hour day shift followed by four days off and then four days on, so those two individuals just rotate out. It works for a short period of time as long as they see an end of the, to the tunnel and, and know that they're going to get on a 24-hour shift. But I will tell you, when we instituted this plan last year after you funded those two, we were in a hiring process last fall, and we also needed some per diem members. So we um, hired the full-time candidates that we were going that weren't authorized in the budget to start until April. I couldn't hire them as full-timers, but I hired them early in the fall, knowing that I was competing with all my peers and said, look, come to work for me per diem, I'll give you as many per diem hours as you want, and then I'm going to make you a full-timer April 1st when the money's available. And we get some great candidates, but unfortunately within just a very few weeks, uh, we lost those. One of them went to the city of Biddeford because they had a 24-hour schedule <coughs> and full-time benefits four months earlier than I was able to do it. So this two at a time, we understand that we can't have it all at once and, and our employees understand, but if we don't have an end date or we don't keep up with those when we do the two-year increments, it is a serious recruitment and retention issue for sure. And I guess just to summarize, at the bottom of that second page, I did put the numbers down there, so I, I broke out the cost of the full-time personnel. Um, like Chief Moulton, this is based on a, an entry-level paramedic, which is the higher uh, cost. It includes all their benefits and insurances, and I pulled out the cost for reclassifying those officers' positions so you could see what it is. The total cost for uh, the full-year implementation is uh, 211602 And then I had Ruth help me with the calculations so that that works out to a $15 per year uh, or $0.29 cent per week cost for full year coverage, and uh, if we needed to do something mid-year again, um, once again, it would be half of that. We are currently in a hiring process. I heard one of the questions earlier in the day was when would this start? Uh, would October be a reasonable time? We're actually in a hiring process because we have two vacancies in our current staff because of retirements and a, a uh, new employee that's moving to a larger department. So we would be prepared to start full year and, and certainly would appreciate that funding if that's it, what you're able to do. But if not, once again, we're here and, and willing to do whatever we can to move this forward at whatever level you can support. Just a real quick question. On the benefit side? Yes, sir. That's a 45% benefit level. I mean, almost $40,000 of benefits on an $88,000 salary. What's, what's, that seems usually benefits all in run 30% of pay. Yeah, there's some overtime in that as well. When you hire new people, I, I've called it, it, I didn't break it out all that time, but some of that is includes some overtime to cover the um, the sick and vacation time that are allocated. So, so overtime's in the, the benefit line, not the base salary line? Correct. How, mu how much is that overtime that's in that line to you? To you? I mean, you, you can send it. We, we can get it later okay. if you want. Okay. And so the, the, the delay, the impact of the delay, it delays both the hiring and kicking in to the, the new pay grades or the new, the new structure. <coughs> okay, and that's in the comp computation. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Just it's worth noting, uh, there's a third element to his proposal, which I included in my proposed budget, so we're not talking about it today, but it's some additional hours for per diem coverage. I thought, was that, I thought, I thought that was, that was in the, included. I thought that was in the budget. It, it is. is. I was oh, okay. saying that those three pieces were included in the budget book, and so I, yep. to the extent that you're looking, looking at, at the numbers aren't. Okay. So, uh, so, but I'm confused. This isn't in the budget, right? The Correct. 211, that's Correct. that's what we're talking about Correct. now. The per diem, though, yeah, they were. 61,000. Yeah, right. it's right. in right. the budget, right. though. Yes, it is. So, so that's, that's, that's an, thank you. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. All that distinction. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's, that was one my questions. Yeah. Um, Other questions? Yeah. Um, um, Two quick questions. I think you've answered this one already before, Chief. Per diems don't get benefits, correct? Is it just a flat daily? I mean, they get training and they'll get uh, pay, but they don't get like health insurance or things like that, do they? Unfortunately, some of them do now because of the new uh, 
ACA laws. There are a number of our folks that work over that average of 30 hours in a given year, and we are paying health insurance benefits. That's one of the, the arguments hmm. that, okay. uh, you know, there, there is not that much of a delta between a full-time and a part-time employee anymore, and the problem with, with per diems is, is that they, the majority of them, have a full-time commitment and a full-time job with somebody else. And if they get held over from a late call or they get forced into an overtime at their home department, we've got a truck sitting without anybody to drive it that next morning. It becomes a really tough animal to manage when it gets to be as big as a program as we've got. When we started it 30 years ago, we were the only ones doing a per diem program. We had plenty of applicants, and it wasn't a problem. Now everybody has copied our model, and we are competing with you know, departments as small as Goodwin's Mills and, and some real small departments that um, are all after the same pool of candidates. So there's other communities doing the per diem now? There's more? Oh, everybody in the brothers. Are they also, um, are they, um, do you know if they're also challenged by the ACA issue in which they're more than 30 hours or are they managing their per diem to less than 30 hours? Well, I think it's all over the place. I mean, part of our problem is our, our program has been in existence for so long right. that we've got some folks that have been doing this and, and have worked as a regularly numbered shifts for, you know, 25 years um, and taking hours away from them after they've been faithfully working them for a number of years isn't yeah. a good practice either. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, and so the, these two new positions, I assume they're going to come in and be private on a company or Correct. they're not going to be dedicated to the ambulance or anything like that or they, I know they can all cross train, right? I mean, they're all, they're all cross trained. They'll all have the skills to do anything. They will more likely be assigned to an ambulance shift to start with and then we will do a promotional process to create those lieutenants from our seasoned experienced folks in-house. So, but we've got, um, I think you said two ambulances in town that we run? Mm-hmm. And most of the call volume is, is more EMT type of calls, you said, right? Or is that, is that where we're seeing the biggest increase? It is. So are we now sending out engines and things like that on EMT calls of the other two ambulances, or is that kind of a chain of... Well, we, al we always have been. We, we always send an engine with the serious calls because yeah. those are the folks that are closest and get there the quickest, yeah. and they have the AEDs and, and materials to assist. Okay. But our, our, we're not looking to, to fully staff our third and spare ambulance. Uh, we do that, and we have per diem crews and a an on-duty lieutenant. So we use that third truck quite frequently now. Um, I, I don't have the stats off the top of my head. We had five calls all at once today. Yeah, all the all the same, all the same all time. Once. We had to call Sacco and somebody mm -hmm. else. I can't remember who. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how I think we've had 15 or 16 calls since 8 o'clock this morning. Uh, how frequently are you are are you calling in other districts, and are we getting called to other districts? I mean, all this kind of a, an agreement that we all kind of help each other and if, if people get overloaded. Does that happen a lot? It happens frequently, probably two or three times a week on average. Okay. We're helping them. They're helping them. Yeah, sure. I know, it's, I know it goes both ways, too. I, I, I get that. Okay. Yeah. okay. okay. Quick, quick. Yeah. Just a quick question. When's the next, when's this contract expire? When's, when's the next round of contract negotiation? We've got another full year. So this is, a, this is the second. June of uh, 17, I believe, isn't it? Yep. Yes. Yeah. So, so when will you actually start framing the next round of negotiations? What, what sort we of generally start a little bit after the first of that year. It gives us, you know, four or five months to get the job done so before the January end of fiscal year. January 17th. Okay. Um, the question I had was um, kind of twofold. The first is kind of a comment and question that goes into a bigger question. So with the increasing number of calls that are primarily focused on EMT and um, ambulatory calls, um, are we looking to expand the ambulatory program where we're having more ambulances rather than just simply firefighters who are cross-trained? <laughs> the short answer is we're watching the numbers. And, yeah. and one of the things that we've talked about in, in the past is the North Scarborough Station being in a great geographic mm -hmm. location. Um, one of the reasons that we bought the property next door is that there's real estate up there and there's a need, a perceived need, yeah. between Gorham, Westbrook, and South Portland and yeah. Scarborough that um, just the way the communities all come together at that neck of the woods, we're all struggling with increased calls for services. None of us are in a position where we're ready to start staffing another truck to, to do that, but we feel that 
and we've had preliminary discussions, at some point we're all going to get to that critical mass where it would make sense to probably do something regionally. So that that would be a, a different model where we would, you know, share a, a piece and split revenues or there's there's a number of creative ways and I think all the players are, are interested in doing that. We're just not quite at that point we're ready to bring that forward yet, but that's where I see the next growth in in EMS. So this is a step into the bigger question that it has to do with the overall model because if you look at the budget presentation as a whole and you look at um, what has been presented in the past and what's been kind of planned, we're significantly off plan. And so the question I have is um, at what point are we going to be looking at the model to determine is it the right model? How do we achieve greater, um, um, what's the word, not efficiencies, but how do we achieve um, greater success with that model in supporting it? Um, or do we redefine that model? Well, I think that's a great point and, and something that I, I didn't do a full revision of the staffing plan this year knowing that we weren't going to be able to make progress on it, that we would be lucky to be able to, you know, get the second phase of what we proposed last year. But I think this summer uh, or, or this fall, whenever it works, I, I would love the opportunity to workshop with the council and, and look at, you know, updating all of our comparative data that it was in the staffing plan and, and really, you know, get the council to weigh in on a policy decision as to what we want to look like for a department and what the needs are out there, and then once we know and, and have a policy decision as to how we're going to be there, we can work on a plan to get there. I, I think that would be a, a smart way to move it's, forward. It's been 10 years since you started a plan, correct? It has. So obviously I think it's more than... Yeah, we've updated a number of times, but it, it's time to take a new fresh look at it. And starting in year one, we deviated, and that <laughs> continued our <laughs> yeah. so, I mean, At the very least, it needs to be recalibrated yeah. and to appreciate what uh, you know, our abilities to advance it. I mean, it's great to have it on paper. Uh, but let's do it in such a way that it's realistic that we know mm -hmm. we can implement it. Sure. And plan for it, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, um, anything else specific to this, the two fire department positions? Yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you, you Chief. Thank, Thank, you. You Thank, you Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. You're welcome. Thank you. Go out and enjoy some summer weather. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I'll probably, gonna, probably gonna snow tomorrow. <laughs> so go, go enjoy. They're going to wait here with this riveting conversation that happens next. So we're a little off, uh, only 10 minutes over, um, as, you know, as far as, so that's actually pretty good given our um, pat, uh, past uh, performance. So uh, thank you to everyone and um, their recommendations and uh, conversation around that. The next part of the budget is to uh, talk about our final recommendations. Um, we've allocated, um, normally we have until 5 o'clock. Uh, we do have until 6, so since we're running over a little bit, this is actually um, a good move for on our behalf. So um, what I would like to do is, um, um, just to kind of be clear, um, uh, what's the word, open and, not open and honest, but um, I'm always honest, but to be open and clear, um, had a chance to speak with most of the counselors about kind of where would they like us to look at um, on our recommendations coming out of committee to be concise with that as well as try to understand. So. What I've done is worked with Tom um, to kind of do this in a stage format so that we can have clear motions um, to vote on those and then they kind of go into a step. So just to be clear, um, Tom, I'm going to give Tom a chance to, he has some recommendations on some uh, more finer numbers regarding the uh, recommendations that he um, has already been presented in the budget. Um, and then he'll have an opportunity to make recommendations for any other investments. And then, um, then we'll move to, and we'll take each of those one at a time. Um, as motions and votes, and then we will then move to any of our counselor recommendations that we have that we'd like to present forward. I think would be a, a nice, easy way of getting through this. So, uh, Tom, I'm going to turn it over yeah, to you. Just one question to you. Uh, there's a bit of a housekeeping piece uh, that you yes. ended your last meeting having to do with the wage and benefits in yep. the executive line. Um, can you take this up later or you can clear it up now? That would be great if okay. you could clear it up. There is a, a handout that's in your packet, which is something like this. <laughs> So uh, the top sheet, and I'm going to ask Ruth to jump in in a moment here, but the top sheet I think is what really caught Councilor Hayes' attention. And uh, there, we did detect an error in this, but uh, I'll let Ruth explain, uh, explain this and we'll certainly take questions. So this front sheet, um, I think we had given it earlier. Essentially, um, there was a question about breaking out in the budget document how much of it was wages and how much was benefits because it was all as one number. And um, as a result of that, there were, under the administration budget, the wages, administration wages were showing a 20% increase and benefits were showing a 5% for a total, 8.8%. .8%. Um, 
when we reviewed those numbers, what we found was that um, there was the uh, some wages were included twice once under the administration full-time pay line for the town manager and then again under the salary adjustment line. So if you look at your second sheet, um, it shows what was presented in the budget for those two lines and um, the second line it was showing a proposed of 136525 under um, administrator full-time pay. It's the second line. And yep. then yep. on the second page. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. However, that really should have only been if you go to the last page of the spreadsheet of the uh, the next page. 12. Excuse me. If you go to the next page for that same line. It really should have only been instead of 136,000, it should have been 124,000 because that number was in twice. So the initial increase for that one specific line was 12% as proposed in the budget. Really, it's only 1.8. That's going to be one of the uh, Finance Committee recommendation adjustments that we're going to ask you to approve to, you know, to fix that one line. Uh, the second question that came up was what made, uh, why was that 20% there? And if we go to the second page again, or the last, the last page that shows the corrections, um, the additional increases in the salary adjustment line. Yeah, and what and what is that? The salary adjustment line is made up of the manager's uh, salary increase. It's also made up of the merit merit um, merit pay for the staff as part of the payment uh, the salary plan that went into effect a couple of years ago, and um, this includes I'm not sure how many staff I forget how many staff there were, but staff and so it's like a one and a quarter percent for those number of staff based on their current pay plus any uh, benefits associated with that. So it's all of that is in there. What happens is what we'll do is we allocate that most of that out to the departments for, you know, if it were a finance department employee who was receiving a merit, those monies would come out of this line and and add to the that employees but, wage. But, but I guess my question still is, in 2016, the budget was 13-1 for those adjustments. This year, the, the budget is for 24,000, or for 37-5. Correct, because that's, that's a pretty big increase. So well, that's because it started out higher than that. The 13,000 is what's left in there after the merit has been adjusted to what the other departments. Upon approval, we actually distribute that money out across uh, the department. So there's a there's a budget adjustment uh, done after so the, approval. So the 2016 budget amount is not actually budgeted. It's actually it's what's remaining. What's remaining? So because they so it's not it's not it's not, a, it's not a fair percentage increase ratio. Correct. It's not a budget. We give the number. I'm quite sure that number is quite a bit less this year than it's been in years past. The um, on this page that shows the corrections with the administrative wages, it shows a 14 percent in the yellow. It shows 14 percent total for that administration piece. Mm -hmm. Once those wages are allocated out, that 14 percent drops to 3.4 percent. So the wages that get allocated out are for the compensation adjustment for other employees and other departments. In other departments. Yes. And so you're saying after for the 2017 proposed budget, after it gets distributed out, it's 3.4 percent. Correct. Is that what you said? Instead of the 14 percent, it would drop okay. to 3.4. All right. Thank you. And like I said, I don't remember how many people there were that yep. that are yep. Thank affected you. by that. Okay. But. Thank you. So, as a follow-up question, just to make sure. So the challenge is that we're dealing with an $87 million budget in which we're talking about $20,000. I just want to make sure I'm clear because I didn't follow the numbers, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> overall, across the board, everyone is being treated according to their contract and treated equitably and fairly. No one is getting, there is no over budgeting. There is no, other than the one mistake that you pointed out, the $12,000. It is consistent across the board for every employee, including the manager, based upon his contract and every 
and teachers and school and everybody Yeah, I'm, else I mean, right I'm leaving now. that part alone, but I just want to make sure it's, from a managerial perspective, it's fair and reasonable, the numbers that are projected outside of the $12,000 mistake. Correct. Okay. As long as that's they're getting their that's COLA right. and... Okay. And that salary adjustment line, if we're in a contract negotiation year, you'll, that's where we'll tuck a sum of money for financial aspects of a contract settlement that we don't want to divulge uh, because we're in negotiation. So you'll see that number we can demonstrate over time. It, it fluctuates <laughs> tremendously and, and it goes sometimes quite high in a contract negotiation yeah. year. So um, with that information, um, what I wanted to suggest that given the dollar amount in comparison to the budget, it will have absolutely zero effect on the tax rate. Um, is it um, okay with the other counselors if we simply, it's a friendly amendment, it's going to be just a corrective error. We don't need to approve it. It's just be a correction to well, the budget. Well, it will be in. It's, it's, in. it's one of our Oh, it is included in that recommendation? Yeah. Oh, okay. So we can move right Oh, so that. that's the first one. Okay. That's right. All right. So let's move right to that. Um, as, uh, as Sean pointed out, I've been working with him and others, uh, you know, preparing for this, and it's uh, a series of recommendations for your consideration. The first one, the first sheet includes kind of uh, a number of these you've kind of heard about. Chief Moulton uh, touched on a number of them, but it's really, we've been keeping track and capturing uh, first, expenditure adjustments. These are, are savings, if you will, to uh, from the proposed budgets or reductions from the proposed budget. Those total about just over $90,000. And we can walk down through each of these if you like. Um, and then below that, we have a number of revenue adjustments that we'd like to propose to you. We've scoured the uh, revenue projections and are very comfortable with these increases. Um, uh, that totals $250,000, and so there's a net benefit, if you will, by um, expenditure reduction and revenue increase, uh, um, increases of $340,097. Um, if it's the, um, I would recommend if it's the will of the committee to take the number in its aggregate and if you have any specific questions around any individual lines that we could propose those. I'm comfortable with that. I'll, um, I'll Peter, though, please. The only one I'm not necessarily I'd like to hear a little bit more about the excise tax two hundred thousand dollar increase. Sure, there's okay. a there's a final piece in your sheet uh, in your packet rather. Might be a separate thing all by itself. Yep. It's a loose yep. um, single page. Yep. Yep. Thank you. So this uh, the first line is excise tax. We're currently our budget is four point nine million for current year. Uh, year to date, we're at four point seven two eight. And we estimate between now and the end of the fiscal year, end of June, uh, another 500000 based on historical uh, collections. So that puts us at about 5.2. And uh, in the proposed budget, we had uh, just carried over the 4.9. So we're, we're confident based on this uh, that there's at least another 200000 uh, Keep in mind if obviously any excess revenue really falls to fund balance, and that's not a bad thing either. Mm -hmm. So there might be some additional capacity, but I, I wouldn't recommend, I don't think we need to go much much deeper than this. So consequently, I've recommended an additional 200,000 and feel very confident that we'll reach that. Um, and then we did, th uh, the other three that we're looking to increase were the uh, planning department revenues, and we did that same kind of analysis. Absolutely. And so just for the public, um, in the plumbing permits, there's a recommendation to increase um, permit revenue by 5,000, building permits is by 10,000, and electrical permits by another 5,000. So it gives us an additional $20,000. Um, the only thing I, I want to say, um, so before we get into discussion, so um, any other questions about any of the individual items that are within the recommendation? And by the way, I just want to make sure that, um, this it will be available, even though we're kind of summarizing the conversation. This information will it be available, um, and I'll make sure that people get to see every one of the line items that we're making the adjustment. Um, a highlight on the revenue side, the only other big one I did want to mention has to do with the um, HIDA administrative revenues, as Chief Moulton mentioned. You know, the administrative reimbursements that we're receiving is um, actually better than originally projected by 30,000, which is a nice. Um, yeah, nice piece of information. No, that's a curious one. That revenue shows in police. Uh, the actual production of effort is through finance. It's right. really uh, we're, we serve as their fiduciary, um, and so it's really to cover all of those administrative costs upstairs. But nonetheless, it, it is a, a police revenue. Absolutely. There's a capital piece to this as well, and it's um, 
I think Mike Shaw just touched on this. I might as well just bring it up. Perhaps you can wrap it in the same motion. It has no actual effect, but the budget numbers um, um, are different, and we'd like to make sure that the budget, the approved budget, does reflect it. Essentially, we're looking to reduce the, the actual cost of that loader backhoe uh, by 54,500, um, and that's what this motion yep. would do. Which reduces the bond revenues, but we also are getting a trade in, so that well, offsets. So the, the net effect to the to the tax rate is zero, but sure. we just need to show it in the proper mm -hmm. places. So any any, que any more questions regard? So um, I'll be happy to make a motion that we accept both the recommendations of the manager for the municipal reduction in expenditures, the increase in revenues, as well as the uh, neutral change in the capital budget, since it's related to the um, assessment. Um, unless there's objections, uh, but are there any specific questions regarding any of the line items that are on the recommendation? I have none. So. Um, I will make a recommend. Um, so I'll start. Um, so I, I move that we recommend the uh, net reduction of the municipal expenditures by. I'm going to do this on a, kind of in a, by ninety thousand ninety seven dollars increase revenue adjustments by two hundred and fifty thousand, and also amend the capital budget budget expenditures by fifty four thousand five hundred as a dec negative or as a reduction, and then increase in the revenue adjustments by fifty four thousand five hundred. Second. Any questions or comments regarding the recommendations? So I, well, Go I just want to say, I, 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 I want the, the public to know, the, the budget process is a fluid process. You know, I mean, these adjustments are, I have come over further scrutiny as things become more relevant and available. And in case there are questions of why didn't we know this ahead of time, uh, you know, it's a living, breathing process. So um, I, I want to thank staff for putting in the due diligence and, and uh, you know, it's not a, an awful lot of money on an $81 million budget, but it's a significant amount, and I think that helps us make some staffing decisions a little more easily. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Comments? Questions? No. no. I have none, um, except for, uh, like you said, it's a natural process, so I appreciate the effort. Um, it always helps. Um, with that, um, all in favor? Three, and that's a zero. Three to zero. Excellent. So thank you. That was the easy one, I think. Yep. Uh, <laughs> if we move to uh, page two, um, this is our table two, I should say. Um, Tom, I'm going to turn that over to you. Sure. It's our next motion. Yeah, I've put before you for your consideration the two administrative positions, and these are uh, projected to start uh, October 1, so there's a delayed start and therefore a reduced cost. And I really do that for a couple reasons. One, uh, one of the positions comes recommended by two different committees. Uh, they both see the value in this. And, uh, and I think, uh, personally and professionally, I think there's value as well. And then also on, on, on uh, the assistant manager position or the finance folks position, uh, again, I think this really rings true a lot of the, to a lot of the conversation that this committee's had uh, in terms of uh, increasing our capacity to do some of the things that um, we agree with, uh, but we need some extra expertise and extra time and attention. Um, and I guess I offer it uh, for your consideration based on all the conversation we've had before, and it does now appear as though we have some additional resources. So I think perhaps my hope is you're in a position to consider uh, this, these positions and perhaps some, some others beyond this. Absolutely. So um, the question I have is that I just want to make sure because there are two additional, um, uh, sorry, there is one additional recommendation. There's a third one that we heard of, uh, from, and I just want to make sure that um, this, we're taking these up in the order of your priority. And yeah, preference. Let me do this. Why don't I uh, allow me to introduce the third proposal as well? Yep, um, absolutely. And so the third is to, uh, to to really move forward and complete what we started last year with the fire department is to uh, bring on those two additional staff people for all the reasons Chief Thurlow mentioned. And my rationale for that, and, and this is a difficult decision not to also advance police because I think Chief Moulton and staff offer very compelling arguments. Certainly not here to say that it's not necessary, but I'm, I'm also sensitive to what our abilities are. And uh, I think in Chief Thurlow's case, the fire positions, for all the reasons he mentioned, uh, make sense. And this was a point of some great discussion among the Finance Committee. I actually took the time to listen to your Finance Committee discussion on April 29th last year uh, around this very matter. And, and I'm not suggesting that a promise a year ago needs to be kept today. Things change. Um, but this is in keeping, and it should be no surprise it's back before you. Um, so just to um, kind of summarize that, 
the manager's recommending, in, um, and, and it's up to us whether we want to combine the two or take them up separately, um, but the two sections are first to approve the assistant. Uh, and by the way, that's town manager, sir, not city manager. That was me, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're not changing the charter here either. I know. Um, is to approve the assistant town manager and a sustainability quarter coordinator um, to actually do a delayed start um, around October of this year. The total impact is a increase in municipal expenditures of 110,594. The second part to that recommendation is to uh, approve a full year, a July 1 start for two full-time firefighters and EMTs uh, with additional position reclassifications for a total of 211,602. And at the time, there is no recommendation on the floor um, for the, uh, uh, the police department's uh, two additional patrol um, officers. So the question I have to the committee, um, First, any additional questions from the manager regarding the positions that we didn't cover? I do have questions. Absolutely. Go ahead. Sir. Sorry. So I'm, I'm trying to do the math real quick, Tom. I'm looking at the budget book, and, and for the two positions, uh, we had one at 61 and another one at uh, 84 or 5. I come up with 145K, not 110. So could you help me understand how that adjustment? It would be a start date of October 1st, so that okay. 30. 40,000, 35,000 would is the savings for starting instead of July 1st, starting October 1st. But just so I'm clear, the annual costs will be 145 45. moving yes. forward in the yes. future year. Yes. Correct. Okay. And likewise on the fire as well. That no. No. Those, no. Are, those are July 1st, and that's really uh, as Chief Thurlow mentioned, they are currently fully involved in a recruitment process, so they would, they will be in a position to hire someone immediately really yes. July 1. So, so then. Are we address them separately or together? Separately? Um, so that, that, so the question. Well, I guess, I guess. Well, first, do you have questions for him? I don't have any questions okay. about that. So now, about the motion or about how we go about this, what is your will? Do you want to combine them together? Or do you want to take them up separately? I'd like to do it separately. Yeah. Absolutely. Can I make and I'd like to introduce a third. So. Yeah. Can I make one <laughs> final comment? Uh, it may help you or may not. Um, clearly, we can get along without the administrative position. I can't sit here and say that they are crucial, certainly not to the extent of public safety needs, uh, but I really felt compelled, given all the conversation we've had, very productive conversation, and the, the outside committee input in, in putting that before you. So I, I don't want um, you to think for a minute that we're not going to get along and, and, and do quite well, frankly, without these. These are truly value-added positions right. that I think would make us take us from good to something better. Um, so just being honest. Absolutely. So what I would like to do, because you mentioned you have the third, um, I'd like to take up at least the two that the manager has presented, and then we can go into the okay. third one as part of our own, if you don't mind. That's fine. Um, so since we want to take them up separately, um, I'm going to take up the manager's table two, which is for the, because uh, that's the order in which he's presented them, uh, for the assistant city, uh, town manager and the sustainability coordinator for the 110594 So in the form of a motion, I would move that we recommend the approval of um, the two new positions for the total increase in municipal expenditures by 110,594. Second. Second. Conversation, discussion. Go ahead. I'll start if you want. Um, you know, my, my, I guess my philosophy is um, I, I'm not really uh, too thrilled about micromanaging the, the process within the town. Uh, if it's the town manager's recommendation that these, these positions be funded, uh, I think I would defer to his expertise. Um, we have a funding mechanism in place. Um, if they're presented in, a, in the order that, uh, yeah, upon discussion with his departments, that that's what they feel is appropriate, then I'm certainly content with that. Um, I do think that the, the, the real cost of both of these positions, um, I'd be hesitant to try and pin down a dollar for dollar cost savings because I think the, the value added piece is going to be some intangibles as well. I think. Uh, both in terms of the budgeting process, putting the metrics together that we'll be able to use from the assistant uh, town manager position to the stormwater beach uh, uh, observer positions that I, I don't know if we could really put a hard dollar value at. Um, so I think we will see savings that we can that we can track, maybe waste reduction savings, things like that. But I do think there are some intangibles in there. So I could fully support both of these positions sure. as presented. Um. Would you like to go next or I can? 
So um, one piece that I didn't cover, um, and I forgot, Tom, that you did provide this to us, so I do want to say thank mm -hmm. you. On the very last page of the proposal is actually four, table, three, four tables. Uh, those tables um, provide us with an analysis of what <coughs> is the tax impact, um, assuming a couple of variables. The first variable is um, assessed valuation remains at the current projection, the manager's projection of a $30 million increase. Um, the second one is um, really looking at, I believe it's the five-year average, 10-year average of what we've experienced, which is a $42 million increase. So um, the very first motion that we approved, which were all of the adjustments and the revenue adjustments, um, are based on what we've approved. Our recommendation is a 2.69% tax rate, and that's before the adjustments regarding these new positions. So um, the reason why I point that out is that if we approve these positions, um, at their incremental start and even at the full, I'm sorry, um, this is just the two administrative positions, the tax rate increases to 2.88%. So uh, keep in mind that we started this budget process at 3.27. So there is still a, um, a valuable, um, I think a valuable message in the total tax rate based upon the adjustments that we're making. Um, and I, I want to make sure, and I'll, I'll cover that as we go through each of those, except for I don't have the um, the rate for I, what I think is going to be Peter's recommendation on the third recommendation, but um, we can talk about that when we get to that point. So, that fairly quickly to yep, so I just want to make sure that people um, <coughs> kind of reference that table because it's table two in that final page. Right. Thank you for pointing that out. Yep. Um, what I wanted to mention really is, that, is to add on to what um, uh, Councilor Chiazzo or Chris <coughs> mentioned. You know, this process by which we manage the town is really what's um, within the confines of what they call policy governance. And that is that um, while we all have our ideas about how we want certain departments to be run, none of us are the fire chief, none of us are the police chief, and we have to rely on, none of us are the town manager, and we have to rely on that expertise. And that expertise should um, have a heavy dependence upon the recommendations that the manager makes. Um, and the reason is because you have to leave that to them um, to understand what the true challenges are. So I'm okay in accepting, and I, and I do have a lot of reliance on the manager's expertise and recommendations with this. Um, I believe that actually both of these are critical. Um, first is that the sustainability coordinator um, advances to very significant policy uh, decisions by the council, um, as well as need, uh, particularly in the solid waste management piece, as well as the energy. We have support from two of our committees in which their expertise that focuses specifically on an item and a topic um, reinforces the need for that. The second piece that's more important is the assistant manager. And outside of taking the budget analyst piece, which can be arguably just another administrator, the purchasing agent piece, which we did have once before in this town, um, provided significant savings. Unfortunately, because of the instability of the budget process and the economy, we didn't keep that position. I can, uh, and this is going back about six years, I think, on when that position was first approved. Um, you're talking more than enough savings or cost avoidance um, that is actually going to pay for itself plus more. So I think that it, and it pays for the other part of it, which is the budget analyst piece. Um, so I am very comfortable in, in providing this, and I'm also very happy to hear that the manager is going to require of both of those positions that they document and keep track and then report out what their efficiency and effectiveness are in each of those positions. That becomes justification for continuation within the budget, especially at a time, should it ever happen, that we need to make any type of reductions in staffing as a result of the economy. So, um, you know, job justification, this is a perfect example of how we're going to be able to achieve growth, incremental growth, and then justify the position. So, I am fully supportive of both of these, uh, both of these items. Anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, and I guess I, I'll be the contrarian. I mean, I, okay. I understand the positions, but my, my priority would be just based on being in the community. Public safety, I think, is Trump's administrative positions, and I really think I might support this. I need to see where we're going to go on police and fire, but that would be my priority, and, and I think you pointed out Again, let's remember there's, there, we found 340,000 in savings. Um, fire and police will consume the majority of that, and that gets us at about 3%, which is what we committed to. And again, what I'm concerned about going forward is this is a half year cost. We're adding full time equivalents, which, you know, we know we have some money from the Wentworth bond issue that's, that's helping our numbers this year. It'll help a little bit next year, but we've got a cliff coming. 
So I think you know we should put this in the hopper and consider it. it may, it's all about timing. We've heard for several years now about the fire and police asking for more resources. I, I think Chief, you know, Chief Mullen made a pretty compelling plea that he needs additional resources. Um, so my priority is fire, police, and this would be the third. So however that shakes out in our conversations tonight, but at this point, um, I, I will not support it until we have those other conversations. Comments? Anything else, Chris? Uh, nope. Nope, nothing right now. Um, so with that, um, there's no other comments. Um, the motion is to approve those. Uh, all in favor? Two. All opposed? One. Thank you. Um, the next recommendation is on going back to actually the page three recommendation. That recommendation is to approve two full-time firefighters in EMT positions along with uh, reclassification of other positions for a total of increase in the municipal expenditures. And this is in the form of a motion, $211,602. And again, that is a full year assessment for those two positions. Um, before we get into any questions, additional questions for the manager regarding the position? Uh, no additional questions, just point of clarification if I could. Um, the additional per diem is not covered in this? It's already included. It's, it's included in my proposed budget. Outside this recommendation, it's already included in the budget. It's already in the budget. It's already it's been okay. all along. Okay. Yep. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. Um, is there a second? Second. For approval? Okay. Comments? Second. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll start again. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of concur with Peter uh, a little bit. I, I, I think my, my, well, my personal opinion is uh, I do think the police have presented a very compelling argument, um, and I do think that we've, we seem to bear the brunt more of complaints and concerns from constituents about uh, police enforcement and community policing and things like that. We, we do tend to hear quite a bit about those things. Um, we don't tend to hear as much from the fire side in terms of call durations and things like that. Maybe that's because by the time if it's too late, then we just don't hear from them at all um, because they weren't fast enough. So. Um, you know, my personal approach would be uh, would be to, um, to 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 find a way to move in the in the police direction. However, I will defer to the management's decision because uh, I also realize uh, from from uh, what Chief Thurlow said, uh, it does put the department in a difficult position in terms of staff existing staffing, timing. Um, uh, I do think that. Um, you know, in, in, in deference to the, the original request last year, it's fair to fully implement that staffing plan first in terms of these additional two positions, not the entire plan, but these two positions first, close that up, um, and then uh, seriously look at addressing the police concerns next year. Um, having said that, I, I expect the council to be looking at um, community policing issues and, and other challenges that we're facing quite regularly through the year uh, and trying to find other ways, whether it through ordinances or through other mechanisms to try and uh, alleviate some of the, the burden on the police force. So it's a difficult call. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's certainly, you know, uh, to me, it's, it's, it's picking the, the, the worst case scenario out of two bad scenarios. But um, I think both made a very compelling argument. I, I think both presented very well. Um, so. Based on that, I, again, will defer to the manager's decision and, mm -hmm. and support the two fire positions. Want to go? No. Um, understand, I mean, I, just so you know, I heard your comment. Yes, I know. So, oh. yeah. so um, for me, this is kind of like asking between your two children, which one do you love the most? Um, and <laughs> um, so it's very, very hard. Um, so two things. Uh, first is that, again, um, well, this comes down to, uh, again, relying on the manager's recommendation as well as the compelling stories, and both stories are um, um, very compelling. Uh, this is actually, by proving this, one, it uh, fulfills a promise that I made last year, which is that we will complete this um, and um, look forward to what the next model is going to look like. So I, I appreciate the commitment to look at that model. The one lesson I think I learned from last year is that I don't agree with incrementalizing it in the sense of, um, I agree with maybe doing two versus four in one given year, but not doing, let's do a half year or a third of a year. I don't think that that's really effective. Um, either we're committed to making the change and making the investment or we're not. So whether 
whether it's this our proposal or even the police department proposal, I, I won't um, support any type of um, delayed start, as I think was what we're calling it. Um, what I do want to uh, suggest, though, is that, um, sorry, I'm trying to read my notes. Um, I, I'm, I'm definitely I'm in favor of this. Um, I don't believe that we're, and this is kind of taking up the next issue, what I think Pete is going to bring up, which is the police department. Um, I, I will be honest, I have a personal preference based upon the comments that I receive from citizens um, about both the, uh, the need for additional services as well as maybe some criticism of existing services and some um, uh, reputational issues around that. But I think that there will be a commitment to evaluate policing services across the board. Um, and when I say, uh, so I'm talking about, when I talk about that, it's ta I'm talking about um, whether it's uh, um, staffing at Higgins Beach for tickets or whether it's uh, traffic on Route 1 or, or whatever it might be, um, everyone has an opinion. Um, and so I think that that in fair shake, one, the fire department completes what I made a promise for and I'm making a promise that I want to make sure that we look at the policing services model next and that we have a full commitment to providing additional services there. Or, or looking at what it is being provided. So I'm okay with this uh, recommendation given the stories that have been told and given the commitment to looking at the model um, and hope that um, um, this truly has an impact because I think that it's, um, in, it's an important case um, that's been made. And sorry, I'm trying to read my notes and I'm really horrible. Staffing models, okay, I covered it all. But um, so I'm, I'm pretty okay with this. Um, there's no other questions. Um, the motion is to approve $211,602 for two additional firefighters and EMTs in the position reclassification. All in favor? Three and none opposed. So the next phase um, is to move on to, so um, with that I just want to um, uh, go back to that uh, table chart, the very last page. With all of those approvals, Based on a $30 million increase, which is already proposed in the budget, we started out at a 3.27% increase, which is about $153 in household, um, in increase per household on the average $300,000 house. We are now at 3.24%. So there is a net reduction as a result of all of those approvals, which is about $151 or saves $2 per household. So uh, from there, um, what I would like to do is now move to any individual counselors' recommendations um, and uh, requests. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have a table because I don't know all of those requests. Um, so maybe we can do our best to model. We'll do our best to model. Um, at the very least, if you want to model and wait until the end, so maybe do a T account, say debit as a credit <laughs> type of thing. Um, and uh, we'll kind of look at that at the end uh, rather than going through each recommendation and seeing what the impact is. So um, with that, um, Peter, I'd like to open up, if you would like to uh, start with your recommendations. Uh, well, maybe the first one would be recommending approve the request by the police department for additional resources. And, and I say that because, you know, we, we have approved administrative positions, but administrative positions will not result in life or death. Um, police resources, I have seen people going through red lights in the traffic circles. If we have two offers at a place and we can't respond to domestic crime situation, it would be terrible if we have a tragic situation and there weren't resources to be there. So I think, I think we need to think about public safety before we think about administrative savings. So I propose that we consider the, the, the police chief's request that he, he is pleading for additional resources to serve the community. So I propose that as a motion. I'll second. fund it for a year. It's um, been moved and seconded. Um, the question I have just for the purposes of the motion, what it was that total amount? Was it a... 140, 149 no. is worst case, although um, Chief Moulton talked, it could be as low as 110 is what he said here this evening. So we've, we've run the model anticipating this motion at 149, kind of worst case scenario. Um, although we might have made some of those, we might have made some of those adjustments already within the evidence technician as part of the first motion. Right, so. But we uh, didn't take the best case um, scenario, we did a middle middle of the road. Just run, run with so what we have, I guess, right now, just to well, give us I a think, I think the savings were if they were hired at step one, and perhaps the chief mm -hmm. could clarify that point. Um, step one was 110. That's what I have as well. That's right. And that's not inclusive of any um, budget savings elsewhere. That was just actual cost. I think so. Yeah. So, um, yeah. 
So Peter, um, it's your motion, so I wanted to make sure that we uh, take up what you want us to take up. Would you like it to be, because the motion needs to be specific. Is it 110, would you like it 110,000 or 149,000? What's your? Um, let's do the 110. Okay. That, that way he has to hire stuff on. Okay. We will certainly make that work whether it ends up being a slightly delayed start just to make sure we have adequate budget. I think the, the point's been clarified, the motion's at 110. So, but stay there. <laughs> but you're suggesting the 110 is at a slightly delayed start because the revenues are, have already been used. We might have already made some of those savings yes, adjustments have. in the first, first right. recommendation. I just want to be clear. I thought I, I thought it could be, depending on the skill level and right. the point of entry of the, the candidates, it could be exclusive of any cost savings elsewhere, $110,000 implementation costs. Did I misunderstand that? Uh, a little bit. The 114 um, was the best case. 149 was the worst case. Right. And what I was saying about the, one, the 110 that I talked about was the savings, which you okay. just okay. said. So, 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 uh, would probably yeah. so if we could make the motion one just round it one fifteen? Yeah, fine. Thank you, you don't mind? One fifteen. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um so the question um so with that motion, um the question I have is the market's the market based upon what you can get, right? Mm -hmm. So if it does come in that you need the one forty nine it, I would assume that you would have to find any, because there is line item adjustment authority within the manager, you would be able to find that obviously within either the budget or some, some other area, but it's not. Or timing. Or t well, um, so the reason why I'm asking the question is that I'm not in favor of any delayed timing. I mean, you can make that decision, but I am not going to support a delayed timing, you know, as part of the decision. So you'll be able to find it within the budget. If you approve it, I will find. Okay. That, that is a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so my, I'll, I'll just finish coming. Um, like I said, um, I have to think while you guys speak, but um, I am not in favor of delay timing. I mean, that's your choice, Chief, but I, I, I'm not going to do these type of positions for delay timing. I, I think it's <clears throat> penny foolish. Questions, comments? Yeah, uh, so um, the first question I guess for Chief is um, what if we just funded one position? Is that a possibility as well? Or are the two, are they offset tandem for staffing or scheduling or something like that? I'm, I'm happy to take whatever you'll give me. It's, uh, my preference would be two. Um, we asked for two last year. So we were denied that and, had, and have been for the last uh, three or four years. Um, I really feel a crunch right now. But whatever you can see your way fit to support, I will accept. So I guess that my, my challenge is we had, we've identified 340,000 in additional savings in the budget through the town managers and the staff's revaluation. We've committed 323 of that already with the previous staff allocations. That leaves us with an, a net positive of 17,000 just based on the savings that the town manager and staff have identified. Um, if we go with the 115 as proposed, that puts us at a delta 98. So I guess um, maybe my question, if I could through the through the chair, of where we would come up with the additional 98, where would we identify that that uh, uh, revenue from, or that that that, in, that from? So, if we were to just accept this as is, that would change between a 30 million and a 42 million dollar. Uh, valuation, the tax rate could go be anywhere from 1602 per thousand down to 1597, okay. and that would be. Did I write that in? Uh, either a 3.11% increase or a 3.44% increase. If if it goes exactly the way it is. Or there may be other places to find savings in the budget. So the question I have to you folks. Uh, to you too. Um, if it is important to identify a revenue source, additional revenue source, the motion as it stands, the revenue source is the tax, uh, is tax. Yes. Um, if you'd like to uh, include, I guess it would be an amendment to the motion to then add the revenue piece to this, um, or um, a reduction in another expense, 
then this would be the time I would say to include that. That way it's one for one given the, the items. Am I going down the right path here on motion? Uh, yeah, I mean, if it's important to the others to, to have a demonstrated method of, to pay for it, yes, it would be appropriate to identify that now. Yeah. It, I yeah. it needs to as a <coughs> technical matter. I, if I need to make <coughs> can I amend his motion? Or yes, uh, amendment. I, I would like to amend that so that we do identify the funding sources first because I think we've done that in fairness, we've done that to the other staffing positions already. Right. Um, if we just rely on the tax base again, um, I think that's going to put us um, potentially out of compliance with our agreed to goals, which was to be at or below 3%. And I think that's a goal we really need to adhere to. I personally think I, we need to adhere to that. We made that promise. And I think we need to try and keep that as best we can. Um, so I, yes, I would like to see an additional funding sor source if possible. So, um, so that's an opinion, not a motion. Yes, sorry. But thank you. Um, well, well, no, <laughs> well, no, I, want this, I want to identify the so source. So if you can identify the source as part of the motion, then? Uh, I, no, I guess that's an opinion, because I okay. have no identification of where it's going to come from. That's, I guess I'd be asking where that would come from. So um, I'll do it in two. So I'll make a recommendation that we identify the revenue source as excise tax that we increase the projections for excise tax by $100,000, which will offset the $98,000 net. Um, and if that is seconded, I'll give an opinion as far as why. Second. Second. So over the last two years in particular, but I believe even three years, we have been somewhat conservative, um, although our conservativeness has uh, lessened over time because of the realizations of what we've seen in those projections. This year we're projecting about a $300,000 uh, differential between last year's projection, I believe last year was four or five hundred thousand um, dollars. No, this year was. I got to go back to the chart. Was it five hundred thousand? Was it closer to seven? Seven hundred thousand dollars. This year is closer to seven hundred thousand. No, it says five. Yes, yeah, sorry, about seven hundred thousand. So um, the issue is, um, from a financial perspective or accounting perspective, either that money sits into the reserve funds which then at the end of the year, if it's greater than 10%, goes to cover capital improvements, um, which some of us can disagree. I don't agree that it should always necessarily go towards capital improvements. It should, could also go into operating um, and fund uh, needed services. Um, or we could do better at projecting our revenue streams as well as our um, um, assessed valuation. And one of our goals, talking about goals, because I agree with you about meeting those principles, is that we will do better at projecting all of our numbers. And so um, now that we know that we've had two years of positive experience that's are significantly greater, I have no problem increasing that projection by $300,000 based on the 500, six, I'm sorry, 700,000 this year. I think it was 600,000 last year. I don't think it's a far reach to be able to do that. I wouldn't want to go any higher, but um, I don't think it's a far reach. Was that offered as a, an amendment yes. to the original motion? Any comments, yes. sir? I support that. It's been seconded. So okay. Yeah, I, I would okay. have a, I, sorry, I have a question for staff. Um, I'd be curious to know what um, staff's opinion is of that because uh, the recommendation uh, exceeds the request by 100,000. That's more than uh, a third, well, almost well, 50 percent over. So the reality is we're in un uncharted territory. I mean, we, we, we know from experience what's happened. Uh, we don't control this revenue source. The, the economy does. Um, I don't think it's uh, not a reasonable too far to reach given our recent experience and kind of how the economy is performing. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess where I end up, um, it's not a bad thing to end the year with a surplus and have it become fund balance. So uh, from my perspective, that's a laudable goal as well. But I appreciate the dilemma that's in front of you. Uh, and I don't think it's, I'm not uncomfortable with what you're recommending. Mm -hmm. Well, just as a side note, I've contributed to that uh, that prosperity recently with two <laughs> new vehicles and twenty four hundred dollars in taxes and excise taxes I paid. So, um, comments, Peter? No, none. No, great. I'm good. Um, so um, we're going to vote on the amendment first, and then go back to the main motion. So the amendment is to approve um, increasing excise revenue projections by a hundred thousand dollars. All in favor? Two. All opposed? One. Um, the main motion is to approve. Um, the 115,000 I didn't copy 115,000 dollars for the two uh, full-time um, police department officers. Um, any other comments, questions, or considerations? None. Um, 
All in favor? All opposed? One, so it's two to one. Um, what I would like to uh, mention, so um, you're keeping track, right? So we'll be able to, okay. I do want to make a, a one comment, so because uh, based on something that was said, I want to, pe I hope people understand that while we are approving this, it is not really an approval, it's a recommendation to the full council because we are only a minority party or a minority group of that council, so the council can still have a very different set of priorities um, and come back and um, make other recommendations or add to them or subtract. And so this is the baseline. So I want people to understand that this is not um, set in stone yet. Um, with that, uh, Peter, any other considerations? Yeah, and I, and I guess I don't, do you want it all in the form of a motion? Or that, how would you? That is up to you. <laughs> um, one one consideration or one motion would be consider reducing the COLA where we can from 1.8% to where it actually is, which is about 1%. And the net effect? So if, it's, uh, if it was the most, then the reduction would be? It's about $130,000 if it's across the board to everybody, but we do have some contractual obligations, so I don't know the exact. It would be public works and town hall staff. So, um, so this is uh, so this is I've never dealt with this. So this is uh, basically a motion to make a change with, with uh, undefined dollar value. Um, well, they should. I mean, they have they have the salaries. I would suspect you can just. But take. Not, are you? I mean, do you want to just go with the 130,000? Uh, are you? I mean, are, it's it's not, no, it's not it's probably not 130,000. That would probably be a jack one question. Yeah, I, I'm afraid to do it correctly, we we would need a dollar figure, and and I'd like to give you exact advice. Uh, I believe Ruth is correct. It would be town hall staff, all non-union staff. So Peter, if you're okay, um, since there hasn't been a second, um, any um, recommendations, I would like to uh, suggest that any recommendations that are what I would call macro level, um, that across uh, affect uh, several departments, that um, we may um, hold those off, if you don't mind, okay. until the full council meeting so that we can get uh, specific numbers for the motion. And we're pleased to work with you to, to come yeah. up with specific dollar amounts okay? to meet yeah. your need. Um, could you include any of the others that might uh, include that as part of your consideration so that it's on the record? Um, what do you mean? Um, so, um, as it relates to COLA? No. Um, so, if you have any other motions that go across the board, so let's say if it's okay. um, yep, gotcha. to get rid of yep. um, employees contribute more to their health insurance, that's across the board and that has a number that we can't calculate today. Okay. So, if we can include those, that way the staff and public kind of know what we're looking at. So the other piece would be a, a proposal to redirect police resources, as we've heard, is an issue from the 18,000 at Higgins Beach to actually enforcing other issues in town. I don't understand. That. Well, the police department has has targeted $18,000 worth of resources to do monitoring of the parking meters at Higgins Beach after the installation of the parking meter, which when we hear of the issues that are in town, I'm not sure that's the highest and best use of our police resources. That can be redirected into doing other things in the community that, that relate to public safety and other things that the, the chief has talked to us about. So that's my motion. So, um, so going back to the previous conversation, that's specific to a particular action. I'm looking for the items that may be larger in scope that we can't define today because that's very specific. I thought you, I thought the larger in scope you didn't want today. <coughs> so was that a discrete motion for eighteen thousand dollars? Yeah. <coughs> so you said, I'm sorry, you said redirect. So is I'll that be very reduction? specific. Hold on a second. Or take it. Mm -hmm. So the global pieces that I'm recommending, so Peter, uh, to the, for the public, I've been able to see Peter's recommendations because he shared them with me. Um, we do communicate very well together. The global pieces is that you had mentioned um, that there could be a use of reserve funds, but yet there was no allocation to that. There was also uh, um, uh, a request to consider increasing employee contributions to health insurance that goes across the board and there's no value in which I can place to that. Right. So I'm looking at all the questions that we can pose to staff that can come back at the full council meeting and uh, give us I, I misunderstood what quantifiable you're numbers for okay. the bigger picture I, 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 missed, I misunderstood yeah. what you're asking. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So specifically then, yeah, on increased employee contributions, I believe our health plans, I'd just, I'd just be curious to get a number, the employees pay for their dependents. 
but they don't pay or they don't pay much for the individual coverages. Most employers are really asking for pretty significant, even individual contributions. Um, so I was, you know, the, the the global question was, what are they contributing, and what would be the opportunity to make some adjustments to that? Part of the town yeah, ordinance. Part of the ordinance change, but we can we can be clear on what that is. Take my okay. Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and again, then it only those it would again be specific to public works and non-union staff because so the others are in. Contract. There's three contracts that are um, dispatch, police, and fire. So those are set contractually, yeah. and then the ordinance actually covers the non-union splits. So the town has committed since I think for a long time 100% um, of single coverage. Um, that would require an ordinance change, and then the town covers 50% of the difference for dependents. So, in my misunderstanding, we actually have in our ordinances health care coverage? Yes. The town Part contribution is codified in the ordinance. Personal ordinance. Really? Okay. It used to be that the uh, health insurance was 100% paid, family, mm -hmm. single, by the town, in I believe 1990 something. They modified it and they dropped it, the, uh, they kept the 100% employee coverage, but then they reduced the uh, dependent coverage uh, down to from 80%, from 100 to 80 to 70, 60, 50, and it's been at 50 since then. Yep. So, is this, um, so is this the personnel policy that's in the ordinance? Is that what you're talking Chapter about? Chapter 303. Personnel? Well, personnel ordinance. There's a personnel ordinance? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll take up that issue later. I don't know why we would have a personnel ordinance but uh, for business, but that's okay. Thank you. That's sure, a sure. Nice clarification. Yep. I did not know. I learned something new. Um, any other items that might you want to? So the COLA that you mentioned, yeah. Yep. Global and, and the other conversation on the table is that last year when we thought we were facing some some shortfalls and some financial difficulties um, with the school, we transferred some funds, reserve funds over this year as we're looking at where we are on the municipal side with the issues that we already have on the table. Um, and with the Wentworth issue is whether there's any room to talk about some re re reserve transfers. So that that is a potential funding source for some of the things we're talking about. So um, I think at least I'm clear. If not, I'm sure someone will straighten me out later. So. The staff will take that into consideration and then report back on some of those items. I'd like to work um, directly. It, it, one of them. To offer them motions. I'll work directly with you and supply you with discrete yeah, and information. Then Peter then gets that information. If you can share it with all of us in advance sure. um, as a courtesy, but um, if Peter then gets that information and wishes to make the motion or somebody else, then we can do that at the finance. Okay. I'm sorry, at the full okay. council okay. level. Um, I do want to mention one of the recommendations. Um, isn't really a research. It's a, it's a um, relationship issue that we have no control over. So um, it's more of an opinion I think that Peter might be looking for that has to do with the school reserves and um, the reallocation back to us, the reserves that we used out of our portion last year. So um, I want to be sensitive that that isn't, that has a much significant, much um, different impact and a more significant relationship impact to this process that needs to be taken into consideration. But um, I'm not sure how, other than knowing what the total amount was that we approved, which I think was 225 or 180,000, somewhere as I can't remember the final number, but, but that comes down to really uh, an opinion and our uh, discussion with the school department, because um, that's their decision. And I believe that once it becomes school funds, and it goes into their fund balance, it can only be used for education. Correct. I'd like to work more that's with my you. My recollection at 180, if that's the number, is the amount that we cut from the municipal side to help side, oh, right size the entire budget. So it was actually reductions on municipal expenditures, not reserve monies. But you may be referring to something else. So not to delve too deep, so for me, the next, um, and not to make the argument, because I don't know if I agree with it or not, is then, um, then the recommendation would be to decrease the amount of the allocation to the school department based upon the number that was appropriated, yes. which is basically asking them to increase their use of fund balance. 
if I'm thinking this through properly. So, but that's a bigger argument that can go to the full council, or not argument, a discussion, mm -hmm. full council. So, and I guess the other thing on, the, on sort of the same is, is whether what our fund balance policy wants to be, and whether we want to use any of the fund balance that you know that we do have on to help get the tax rate, whether you call it tax rate stabilization yeah. or whatever. But there's there's a way to get to the earlier question about how we're going to fund some of these things. You know, I don't know where that belongs, but there's a possibility of using some of the fund balances to do that. So, do you have any recommendation for that? Because that's specific. We did have included in our budget package um, an analysis of fund balance. Did you have a recommendation on what to use? And we've already used a portion of it above and beyond what the council's policy is towards capital in this yep. proposed. Budget. So. Um, so Again, if we do more, then we're dipping into the 8.3 percent policy. Well, let me let me restate okay. let me restate that. So the the council's policy is that we will always maintain a minimum of 8.33. Anything greater than 10 will oh, be applied yeah, over three right. capital improvements. Sorry. So what Peter and not to speak to Peter, but yeah. the net effect of what Peter's recommending is to use the amount that's between 8.33 and the 10 percent, and what that amount is. So the question is, do you have a recommendation on how much that should be? Um, no, I can work with that. I mean, what I was trying to do is get closer to the 3% target for the budget. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, Global. sure. So those are, um, there is a motion on the floor right now. Right. Um, so can I, I'm sorry, that's a good point. What is the motion on the floor right now? Okay. So we were talking solely about those items that are going to be um, reserved and taken to the full council after Peter gets additional information. So, so the next question is, um, do you, now your next one is specific to any particular program, project, or line mm -hmm. item. And the first one you brought up was the $18,000. For Higgins Beach. For Higgins Beach. Is that a, a motion to reduce expenses and to eliminate it? Or are you asking the t police chief to reallocate um, that $18,000 for other services? For other services. Reallocate for other so, services. So Tom, the question I have is, does the, co does the finance committee have that authority? Because that's a managerial decision. Yeah. No, I, I think that's entirely managerial. Uh, but the point's well taken in that we're, we're investing resources in that area because of policy decisions the council's made. Right. So I, I think there's other ways, non-budget, that you can address that issue. Okay. Policy ways. So if, if that is your motion, I'll be happy to second it so that, because it is specific for the purposes of discussion. Any comments or questions, Chris? I would just like to state that that's way too deep into the weeds for us. I do believe that's a management position, a uh, management situation, and uh, I, I certainly do not feel qualified to ask the police chief how to, uh, how to expel his resources within the department. So um, we all tend to get into the weeds sometimes because we all have pet projects no matter what. So I've learned that no matter how big the budget, no matter how small the project. Um, I support the monitoring program and when we talk about what's in the weeds. Um, I will recommend that um, I'm not going to support that today, um, the motion today, because it is a manager. One, it's a managerial decision, but if it's a policy statement that needs to be made, it's not one made by the finance committee, it needs to be made by the town council. Um, I'll be happy to forward the recommendation if it fails on to the town council's chairman to see if that's something that we take up as a policy matter outside of the budget. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily in favor of that based upon the conversation that we've had at this particular point. Um, anything you want to add? No, I guess not. Okay. Um, all in favor? All opposed? You're not voting? <laughs> opposed or in favor? In favor. Okay, so it's two to one? Um, two to one it fails or one to two, depending on how you look at it. Um, next item? Well, based on how the conversation is going, um, <laughs> I guess specifically on the capital improvement projects, equipment, budget, um, a motion to eliminate, at least from this year, the 46500 in appropriations for bathroom remodels at Town Hall. Um, could I recommend, knowing what you're, um, could I recommend that we, in the motion, for the purposes of discussion, also include the other CIP, which is the Planning Department remote? Yeah, I believe sure. that you wanted to. Yeah, both of them. Yeah. So the recommendation is to reduce the CIP by a total of $63,500, and that covers the 46.5 for the Town Hall bathroom remodeling and the Planning Department remodeling. 
Um, for purposes of discussion, I'll be happy to second the motion. Comments, Peter, since you made the motion? Um, just looking again, just looking at, at we, as we talk about the resources that we have and balancing when we do things and when we bring things on and looking ahead to things, I just, you know, 46500 for bathroom remodels and planning department remodel of the customer service area are, are things that may be able to be delayed. Um, come back and talk about them another year when it's not an appro uh, appropriations issue it would be my perspective. Um, Chris, comments? Um, I, I mean, I, I guess I, I tend to agree with, 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 with Peter to some extent. Um, I'm not sure if, I mean, I know it's important to have a positive experience when we're interacting with citizens. Um, I'm not 100% sure that um, 63,000 is going to really make a big dent in the capital improvement project. But on, on principle, I think, uh, um, you know, uh, I, I guess the question would be how to staff would be uh, how critical is it to make these uh, this, this 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 year, or what would happen if we postponed a year? Certainly, the planning department remodel is something that uh, I think would vastly improve improve customer service. Um, by the same token, I don't know if customers would, would notice the difference if we don't make it or delay it. Uh, the bathroom remodel, um, they are getting to the point that they are uh, in need of attention. And actually, the one on this floor is, is the best bathroom. I encourage you to, perhaps on your way out, to go to the one on the second floor. And you might see a different experience. So um, this building's 21 years old, and it's starting to show its age. So I guess then what maybe what I like to do if allowed um, make an amendment to to split the two costs is that uh, by the question yep. yeah divide the question if you will on, on Absolutely. Um, so to divide the question we'll take them up separately um, is there a preference on which one you want to we can address the bathrooms first I absolutely guess. that was for forty six thousand five hundred dollars okay um, so um, while the, um, if it, it do you want to split the question? Do you mind? No, it's fine. Okay. Um, personally, I'm happy with keeping them together, and the reason is that I actually support um, Peter's position at this particular point, only because it's one, it's short term, and I would rather see a more complete plan about what needs to be done to the entire building because it is 21 years old, because I'm sure that um, there's additional needs um, throughout the building because of its age and would rather see a more comprehensive understanding of what gets through us, you know, what gets us through the next five years, rather than simply just taking one piece at a time in different departments. I mean, looking at it more of a building structure piece. So um, I'm happy to vote on each of those, but don't, I don't want you to be surprised if I don't vote for either one of them. I'm sorry, if I um, vote for both of them and support them, so. The five-year capital plan does provide some insight to those needs. Right. Frankly, this is the only physical change. We yep. are looking at carpet replacement, some some beautification, right. but the only physical change is that we envision is this one. And, I, and I'm just saying I'd rather take it up all at once rather than trying to incrementally take it. So, so with that, it's been split. So we're going to take up the town hall bathrooms first, which was 46.5. Um, all in favor? Of removing or keeping in? Removing. It's a, their motion was to reduce CIP by 46, I'm oh, sorry, 46.5. So all in favor of uh, removing that? It's two and opposed? Two to one. Uh, taking up the second item, it's the uh, request to reduce CIP by $17,000, which was the planning department's remodeling. Um, any other comments? Any comments? Uh, um, all in favor? Three and none opposed. Thank you. Um, any other items, Peter? No, like, other than whether it's possible to offset the, the two beach cleanings per week with beach fees, which is what we talked about. Um, so I guess a proposal would be to offset the cost of, of the beach cleanings two times per week um, with an increase in beach fees, which was the, the, the beach cleaning was 10000 bucks for the summer. So if that's um, so, is it to? Um, I know that you had mentioned either reducing it or increasing, reducing the expense or increasing the fee. Yes. What is your preference? Increase the fee. Increase the fee by ten thousand um, dollars. For purposes of discussion, I'll be happy to second that. Comments? Uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I guess um, <laughs> the whole we've been having these these uh, pretty uh, uh, 
torrid discussions about beach access and allowing beach access and granting beach access. It strikes me as kind of ironic that we would now, um, as we've been advocating for beach access, increase fees in order to access that same beach. Um, I, I think it's a service that we, um, you know, would provide. It does benefit the town. Um, clearly, there's been a need presented to, to, to do it. It's just, I believe, on uh, Western Beach, is it, that the no, additional cleaning? Pine Point. Or, oh, sorry, Pine Point Beach. Um, so I, I, uh, I, I don't think that, that, uh, that, it, that it justifies increasing beach fees for something that I think is, should be part of the regular operation. I just need some clarification. You say beach fees. I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, these revenues come predominantly from parking revenue. Is that what you're referring to? Well, it's parking revenue. Uh, you know, I know we pay for to be able to, yeah, the beach, the beach to be have access to the beaches. There passes. passes that you pay for and other things. So that would be really changing the revenue schedule. I guess I would. Uh, we need a specific proposal as to what you want the fee to be. Um, I don't mean to be difficult, I'm just not quite, I think, that, I think the motion needs to be clear on what your intent is. I, I guess I understand where you want to go, but you need to be clear as to how you're going to get there. So uh, my path on the clarity, um, let me, um, how do I want to word this? So I want to provide clarity to it, but I will tell you up front, I don't support this. <laughs> but the clarity to me is that um, Peter's asking for an increase in municipal revenues of $10,000 that it's allocated through the beach passes program. If you add the $10,000 to the revenue, I think staff should be able to take that number and determine what the beach pass amount is going to be so that the final reading, the, ski the, the schedule of fees will then reflect whatever the amount needs to be within that rather than us saying it's $15 versus, it's, it's, yeah. Um, but <laughs> I don't agree because I agree with Chris's comments. You know, we're talking about, um, in the past year, we've talked about not having parking meter fees because it impacts and reduces access to the beach. We talk about not having uh, penalties for parking violation because of people's economic uh, status or inability to pay those because it hinders beach access. We talk about not transferring Avenue 2 because it will hinder beach access to, for me, to then approve increasing beach access fees is contradictory to the arguments that we've had in the past year. Um, and, and, and by the way, it's only the source of where the recommendation is coming from. If it's from a different source, then um, to me it's, uh, it's minor, it's $10,000. But this particular avenue that we're going, no pun intended to Avenue 2, but this particular avenue doesn't float for me. Another pun. Another pun. <laughs> Getting late, it's 5.30. We get a half an hour. <laughs> So, um, sorry, I was dazing a little bit. Any other comments? No. no any comments? No. Um, all in favor of the motion. The motion is to increase municipal revenues, particularly beach uh, fees, beach access fees by $10,000. Um, all in favor? One and all opposed? Two. And anything else for you, sir? No. Thank you. Um, Chris, anything? No adjustments. No adjustments? Um, I actually have a couple. Some of them are rather innocuous procedural items that I'd like um, because I think it clarifies um, and goes back to the principles that we accepted. So the first uh, motion and I'd like to make is to uh, move to recommend that we amend the schedule of fees to include a new category to be titled parking violation fees with one subset to include metered parking fees and to set the rate up for one hour at free. Um, if that is seconded, I can explain why I'm doing that. Did you say free or three? Free. 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 Okay. All right. So two things. One is that there are other fees within the schedule of fees that are listed as free. I can't tell you what they are at the moment, but I did go back and check just to make sure I wasn't creating something new. Second is that it's consistent with the actual policy or the procedures that we're using, the town manager has implemented regarding the only parking meters that we have, which are down to Higgins Beach. And the third factor is that based upon the policies that the council has implemented, this gives an annual review to the impact of what those parking meters will have as it, re as it relates to the policy decision. Um, guarantee it has no monetary impact, but it is part of the schedule of fees that we then have to approve on behalf of the council as part of the budget. So I'm hoping that you would uh, add that. Comments? No, I agree. Comments? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's a, I could support that with the understanding that it's also a caveat to go back and revisit it year in and year out because it's something that's now on record that we can go back and evaluate. So um, schedules before you as part of the budget every year. So right. 
in front of you. Right. And that doesn't prevent us from changing it during the year sure. should some finding of the manager, you know, in the implementation um, cause us to do that. So I appreciate By that. By default, it's in front of you needs to be the budget order yeah. every year. Anything else? Um, all in favor? Three, none opposed. Thank you. Uh, the next item is, um, uh, if you will uh, oblige me, is to move to recommend an increase in allocations to outside agencies and specific allocation to Project Grace by $8,000 and to decrease the dedicated or restricted account titled asset forfeiture account by $8,000 um, with the condition that Project Grace will dedicate those funds to support Operation HOPE. And if there's a second, I'll explain why I structured it the way that I did. <coughs> I'll second it. Thank you. Um, so um, outside of the motion, and I'll explain why the motion, because it is uh, kind of technical, but then I'll explain the quality uh, behind the request. First is that, um, Operation Hope is not an outside agency, so I wasn't sure how to allocate that based upon what my intentions are. So um, I know that Project Hope supports, I'm sorry, Project Grace supports Operation Hope. And so through this allocation, which we were told by the police chief at the last meeting that the asset forfeiture account could be used in this fashion, um, I'm hoping um, through the dedication request um, is that Project Hope will use that in support of the times of need when there are constraints in finding additional beds um, because it has been a highly successful program. Um, I think that um, we are very lucky to have the police department that we have that founded this program and became a leader within the region and the state. Um, why not the community as a whole to support some uh, small portion of that? We are already absorbing the operational costs primarily through the, oper through the police department. Um, the issue isn't dedication, there isn't leadership, and it isn't commitment to the program, it's the number of beds for the people to be able to then find um, help and support. And for me, it's a qualitative statement on behalf of our community, let alone um, what is absolutely needed, which is greater attention by communities and police departments on the issue. So, uh, comments? Yeah, I'd be curious to hear from staff, again, what, they, uh, what their thought is on this. I mean, I don't know if Chief Moulton had, had earmarked those funds for a specific use already or if they were going into general purpose or if there was some other uh, allocation for them already on the books. I'll have to have as Chief uh, to come up. The uh, asset forfeiture funds are, as, as I think you reported to you at the last meeting, uh, are, are purposely used to support or supplement their appropriations to do kind of special things. I can tell you, and he'll, I think, confirm this, that. Yes, the forfeiture account has been, played a critical role in kind of so far as ha in how we're running and operating um, really a, a, from a cash flow point of view um, this Operation Hope and then donations come back in to support that. So it, it's already in play uh, and we certainly appreciate the sentiment um, of the motion. Yeah, I mean, I certainly appreciate the sentiment as well. I, I think uh, what the manager said is correct. It, we. Although we haven't designated a specific dollar amount, it's always been my intent to reconcile um, any shortfall that we might have in donations for what we have for expenses at the end of the fiscal year. That was always my intent that that would come out of asset forfeiture money. Uh, just philosophically, I felt like taking money from drug dealers and using it Amen. to help those people that they hurt is... So then I guess from a procedural standpoint then, what, why would we need to funnel it through Project Grace? Why couldn't we just uh, transfer it within an interdepartmental account? Uh, good point. I, the, your motion had it going additional funds to Project Grace? Yes. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's... So, so in that's essence, what this, what this activity does is memorializes in paper the, the practice of what is already happening, right? And sets a, a specific dollar value because right now, um, nothing has been reported on what that dollar value amount is. Yes, trustee. That could be a th right now. That could be a thousand dollars. It could be ten thousand dollars. I'm simply memorializing the amount. May I ask you? Uh, would it be possible? Would you? I think the full council ought to be very receptive to to this idea. Would you allow us some time just to think it through to make sure that what you're proposing we can actually do? Um, and there's also some things in motion in terms of what the future project. Hope or Operation Hope and, and how our involvement. There's been some very good developments in terms of grant funding and other resources. Um, I'm just, as we sit here, I'm not sure exactly when all of that's coming to play. So I, I very much appreciate the sentiment of your motion, and would you allow us the time just to make sure that it's 
put forward in, in such a way that it can be used the way you intend? Sure. If, if you second it, I mean. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, like I said, I don't have a concern with the, with, the, with the sentiment. I think it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. I, I concur with it 100%. My concern is that, I, I mean, uh, and I understand now your methodology for wanting to run it that way. Um, I, if we could do it faster, easier, cheaper with just an intergovernmental thing, we could also make mention to it or proclamation or something if we wanted to bring it bring that out or something, I think. The other concern I would have, honestly, is going to be on the charitable contribution side of things because that would, we've already got a budget fixed at 38000 I believe, for charitable contributions. Would this impact that and then put us over now our policy, which we set last year, of restricting certain amounts um, on, on charitable contributions? So I, I wouldn't want us to run afoul of any existing uh, ordinances or, or, or policies we have in place now. So to clarify, if I remember correctly, Tom, if you can mm -hmm. correct me, um, last year we approved 50, uh, the original request was about 60 some odd thousand, we approved 50 something thousand. This year the total requests were about 75,000, however we're only funding 12. Right. Correct. So, um, and that all that 12, as you know, goes to Project Grace only. Project Grace, Project Grace only, and to keep in mind it wasn't an action of our decision, but an action of the policy. And the reason is because Project Grace is the only one that now qualifies based upon the new guidelines. Um, what I'm suggesting in my motion is um, there's two parts, and I'm okay with waiting until the full council, and I can withdraw it. Two parts. One is that I want to memorialize in writing, not necessarily just in writing, but by budget, our commitment to the program, specifically not necessarily to the operational cost, but to the, the, the constraints that we're dealing with, which is finding beds for people. That is the constraint. It's not the commitment by your staff by any means. So how we do that, I'm okay with doing that, especially if we're already allocating money. Um, I guess what I'm saying is that uh, maybe part of the budget is that there's a line item that says Operation Hope and there's a revenue or there's a cost associated with that and there's a revenue offsetting. Let us think that through. I'll be happy to do that. I just think that I personally would like the commitment of the community to the program. And it, it strikes me the full council ought to be receptive to that emotion. So. So, um, so I, I will withdraw that completely and wait until the next council second reading. Um, the last motion I have is um, a more procedural, um, but it's um, actually in response to other councils who shared, and I think that um, if we agree with this, um, it will send um, some supportive message. First is, it's to move to recommend if the $100,000 senior recreational area project is approved by the council, that we should request final approval of the project, the project's placement, and the final cost estimates by the full council. Um, if there's a I'll second, second, I'll be happy to explain. Second. So I think that there's a consensus for the need. Um, my understanding is that the, secret, uh, the Senior Recreation Advisory Committee has supported the project, um, wants us to move forward. There is some um, um, tweaking, I think, that needs to happen. Some of us um, are focused, like myself, focused on the location and where we would like to see that. Some have focused more upon what does the project actually provide for services, and I think that um, this process will allow us to look at that. Um, the reason for the motion is because it's a bonded issue and it's not um, automatically approved, so it will come back to us as part of the bond request anyways. Um, but I, I think this will make um, other members of the council as well as others that I've talked to in the community very happy that we're looking at the full project. Okay. Okay. Any comments, questions? Nope. All in favor? <coughs> There's no financial impact. There's no financial impact, but it is a recommendation as part of the, right, the non-monetary recommendation. Nope. Um, so with that, um, what is, do we have at least, um, I'm not necessarily looking at the tax rate, but do we have a final um, allocation expenditure amount? Uh, we can calculate the allocation. The, in terms of like the net budget or? Yes. I am showing. Yep, go ahead. It's a hundred bucks, so I'm sure nobody cares, but. I'm going to hold you accountable to that. Yeah. <laughs> Figure out your pay. million, three, three, one, one, seven, eight. So referring back to um, the chart that, uh, I'm going to find it now, the chart that uh, Tom provided to us, just for clarification with all of what we've done today, we started out with a budget, a net budget of uh, $60,397,000, $479 with a um, estimated tax increase rate of 3.27. This um, final approval to pass this on to the council is $60,331,178. Um, that is a net reduction, and I'm going to round, of approximately 66 
$66,000 and change. So generally speaking, it's going to